大家好，我是全球杰出华人艺术家协会主席，欢迎大家参加 GOCAA International Piano Competition。啊，今天是全球网络赛区的比赛。那我们今天呢，非常荣幸邀请到任教于茱莉亚音乐学院的 Matthew 博士为我们举办讲座。今天呢，他首先会为我们讲。如何正确的使用踏板，这在于钢琴学习里面都是非常重要的一个话题。第二个呢，就是少年 A 组的这个选手的点点评。那希望大家能在我们的比赛之中获得更多的学习机会。那今天有请我们的主持人 Melody。Thank you, Miss Pan, and Welcome everyone to the preliminary round of the eighth GOCA in international competition. I'm the moderator, Melody Ha. Today, the Global Outstanding Chinese Artists Association especially invites Dr. Matthew Odell. Dr. Odell is a classical pianist with worldwide experience performing as a solo pianist, chamber musician, and soloist with orchestra. He is a founding member of the Hampton Trio and Acacia Ensemble. A group that presents outstanding pieces from the established repertoire alongside new works written for them. His special love of the art song repertoire has led to countless recitals with singers from around the world. Dr. Odell has been awarded the Press Award, the Sarah Stuman Zero Award, two Peabody Career Development Grants, the Lucrezia Bori Grant, the Virginia Ellison Company Award. And numerous fellowships and grants from the New Hampshire State Council of the Arts. Currently, he teaches at the Juilliard School and often gives master classes, lectures, and workshops at professional conferences and universities throughout the U.S. and Europe. Today's program is divided into two parts. First, we are going to have Dr. Odell to give a lecture on how to use pedals correctly. Then he is going to give comments to the test contestants from. The junior division A and based on their submitted performances. Now, please welcome Dr. Odell. Thank you very much, Melody. Appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here, and I am very glad for the invitation to be here. I'm also very glad that all of you have joined me today, joined us today, and I realize that some of you are not that far away from me, but others of you are in other countries, and in fact. On other the other side of the world, and so I appreciate、uh, you joining me from whatever time zone you're in. I realize some of you had to wake up extremely early to、uh, to join me today. So thank you to everybody. I really appreciate it. So what we're going to do first is I wanted to give a lecture about pedaling at the piano, and because it's a topic that I feel like no matter how long you've been playing the piano. Or how experienced you are playing the piano, it's always something that you have to think about and that you have to work on.、Uh, it never really stops the work on the pedal. You can always become better at it. And some of what I say, maybe everything that I say, will be、um, something that you've already heard before and know. So、um, if that's the case, then this will just be a reminder. And maybe there will be some things though that、uh, I will mention that will be brand new for you. So、um, you know, if that's the case, then I hope you'll be able to take away some new things that you can use in your practice. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about the pedal by looking at a couple of pieces and seeing how we might use the pedal in those pieces. And so we'll do that. And I think there will be time at the end. And if anyone has questions,、um, feel free to ask.、Um, you can just put them in the chat. And then we can answer them if we have time at the end. So be thinking. If I say something that,、uh, may, that gives you、um, brings to mind a question, then feel free to ask that. I'm happy to answer it if I can.、Um, so all of these pieces that I'm going to be playing little excerpts from today,、uh, they're all things that I've played years ago. So they're not things that I'm actively practicing today. So you'll probably hear a lot of wrong notes, but. I'm playing these pieces because I think that they all, that they each piece has something to to teach us. So the first thing I want to do talking about pedal is to look at pedaling in Baroque music. So we're talking about like the music of Bach and Scarlatti and Handel and other composers from that time period. Now some people think that we shouldn't ever use the pedal in this kind of music because、uh, the modern piano hadn't even been invented. 
really um, at this time period. So, uh, and, and that's certainly a valid, um, a valid point. And so some people will just not use the pedal at all. And that's, that's their choice. I think because we are playing on modern pianos that we should be free to use the pedal as long as it still sounds um, appropriate to the style of Baroque music. So I wanna look at how we could do that. Some of you, your teachers may already have uh, told you how, or they may have some ideas. So I'm just gonna offer some other ideas. Maybe they'll be exactly what your teachers have said. Maybe they'll be a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen so that you can see the pieces that I'm talking about. So if you can't see them in just a second, I'm gonna share them. And if for some reason it doesn't come through, let me know. Can you see that? Can people see? I hope. Yes, Dr. Okay. Odell, we can Great. see it. Wonderful. Great. I hate when I talk about something, assuming people can see what I'm talking about, or and then they can't. So uh, here we have uh, the prelude in C sharp minor by Bach from the Well Tempered Clavier Book One. I know a lot of you played in your videos, you played the C sharp major uh, prelude and fugue. This is the next one in the book. And, you know, in Baroque music, we have a choice. You know, we have a, we can play staccato, we can play legato, we can play um, a couple of different, we have a couple of options that we can use for our articulations. We can do something in between staccato and legato, kind of a halfway in between. We have choices that we don't always have in some other um, musics because, you know, Bach and Scarlatti, they don't exactly tell us exactly what they wanted us to do. So we have to use our best judgment. And in some pieces, if you really feel like the whole piece should be staccato, then the pedal is something that you don't have to worry about at all. But there might be some pieces where it would make sense to have a little bit of um, legato or maybe a lot of legato. This particular prelude, I think, works very well with a legato style. And so that means that you may have some places, though, where you can't completely make legato with your hands. You'll get as close as you can. That's part of our job to practice is to figure out the fingering so that we can make it as legato as possible. That's true in Bach. That's true in Mozart and Beethoven and so many other composers as well. We always want to do our homework to try to get as close as we can to a true legato with our hands. And then we rely on the pedal for everything else. So in this um, piece, there are going to be some places where I'm going to have to release my hand to get ready to play the next note. And then there will be a little bit of a break. So if that's in that case, you want to put the pedal down very quickly. Uh, the place that I want to show you is in measure three. Let's see, I'll move my cursor. It's right in here. So I'll start actually at the beginning. But if you notice when I get to measure three, I have to release my thumb here on the G sharp so that I can play the G sharp again on the rolled chord. And I'm going to do it first without pedal. Start at the beginning. So there without pedal. There is a little bit of a break. It's not a bad thing, but it does interrupt the legato that I've already had going on in the piece so far. So if I want to add pedal to connect, here's what I do. I put the pedal down right after I play that G sharp with my thumb. Pedal goes down. And then as I play the rolled chord, the pedal comes off. So the pedal is just for a fraction of a second. It's for less than an eighth note because I don't even put it down when I play the G sharp in the thumb. I put it down after. So it's really, really short. And I can use it in other places too. If I need to connect from one chord to the next. And here again, I'm gonna need to replay some notes. So I use the pedal to connect from at, right after I played this E natural in my left hand that I have the cursor by, then I put the pedal down and then I take it off right when I play the chord. So what that does is it connects things, but it doesn't make it sound blurry. What you always wanna avoid in, the, in Baroque music is that blurriness because they didn't have pedal in, um, uh, like we do, the sustaining pedal um, it, on, on their instruments back then. 
So uh, to put the pedal down for longer than that really makes it not really sound appropriate to the time period. So we want to avoid that. So there are many places in Baroque music where I will use the pedal. But honestly, if you weren't watching me play, if you were just listening to me play, you'd probably not have any clue that I was doing it because the pedals are so short. Uh, my foot just goes down really quickly. What we'd almost call like a flutter pedal. Maybe your teacher has used that word, the flutter pedal. That's where you just tap the pedal for just a split second and then you get off the pedal. So uh, that's definitely what you wanna do in Baroque music when you wanna use the pedal. It's not something that we wanna sustain for a long time. There's another piece by Bach that I wanna show you, which is kind of different. And uh, we don't usually see this in the works that we play on the piano, but this is one piece. This is a fugue in A major. It's not part of either of the books of the Well-Tempered Clavier. It's all by itself. And it hasn't really been specified to be played by any particular instrument. It can be played by piano or organ, uh, but uh, it does work on the piano, but it was originally written for an instrument that has a pedal that creates a pitch, not a pedal that sustains like we have on our piano. Uh, but a pedal that sustains a pitch. And so you see here a couple of places. Here's pedal marked in parentheses, and here's pedal written down below this long E in the, in the bass, which goes for two and a half measures. That's an example of where you will actually see the word pedal in Bach. That's really pretty much the only time that you'll see the word pedal that Bach actually includes in his score. It's really because he is giving a pitch, and he it's one that you can't really sustain um, on a regular keyboard instrument. It's one that would have been in intended for an organ or even more likely a harpsichord that had foot pedals that played pitches. Not every harpsichord had that, but there were some really big, large harpsichords, and you can see pictures of them online, where you actually had um, foot uh, pedals that, were, that each played a, a different pitch. Each was connected to a different string, a low string. And so this would have been possible on that kind of harpsichord that we don't see too much of today. But if we're gonna play it on the piano, that really requires us to do something. It doesn't mean that we just hold the pedal down like it is marked, but it requires us to play everything else that Bach had intended to, to, play in the, to be played in the right hand and the left hand. We suddenly have to play that with just the right hand because my left hand is sustaining this low E right down here for two and a half bars. So I have a lot of work to do and it's really kind of impossible to connect that. And at this point in the piece, I am wanting it to be legato. There are other places in the fugue, it, earlier in the fugue, where I do have some staccato uh, playing. But here at the end of the piece, it seems to make more sense to me to play legato. So I need some help from the pedal. So again, there I use very minimal pedal again, just as quick as I can. Uh, just to get into it, I'll start here on the second to last line, the second measure, and um, I'll show you what I mean. So I didn't use the pedal as much as I would have been, say, a piece by Chopin, but I was using the pedal an awful lot, particularly in this measure right here where my cursor is, that first measure of the last line, because it's so spread out that it's really impossible to be able to play all of that with just my right hand and make it legato. So there, my pedal is really working over time, and I'm just fluttering the pedal up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, so that it sounds connected, but doesn't sound really blurry. If I were to hold it down, of course, it wouldn't sound right. It would sound too blurry. So um, I just end up having to flutter a lot. And that's something that we have to do oftentimes. So we have to just get used to using our foot in a really light and free and easy way rather than in a hard way. So make sure that you're, that you're the whole mechanism of the pedal, like your foot, your ankle, your, your toes, all of that, that needs to be very loose and free so that you can use the pedal as quickly as the piece needs, really. So in the Baroque period, we're basically just going to use the pedal to connect from one note to the next that we can't connect with our hands. And then if we were to go to a little bit forward in time to say Mozart, then we have sort of a different thing. I mean, in Mozart's time, they did have pedals, 
on their pianos. They actually had pianos um, and uh, they had pedals. Um, the pedals most of the time were played with your knee. So I don't know if you've ever seen a piano like that, but it's kind of fascinating to see and to try it too, um, because you end up keeping your foot, your toes on the ground, and then you just lift uh, the back of your foot up. It's the opposite of what we do now. And that lifts your knee up. And sometimes you end up holding your knee up for quite a while. So you get, you get some exercise. <laughs> but uh, it's a really interesting thing to try that kind of a, a piano with the knee pedal. But they, anyway, they had pedal, but they're still in, in the, this time period, particularly with Mozart and Haydn, the early classical period, we want clarity more than anything else. And so if we use our pedal, like we would in Schumann or Brahms or Chopin or Tchaikovsky, it's gonna to be too blurry and it's not gonna sound quite right either. And so there are things, uh, this is actually not the sonata that I wanted to show you first. I wanted to show you this one over here. This is the G major sonata, which some of you may have learned. What some people do is they like to put the pedal down here for this long chord in the left hand. And they do a couple of things. Well, they're holding down the F and the E together, which creates a little bit of a blur. So you've got to be really careful not to do that. If you were to use the pedal here on this measure, you'd have to wait until after you played the F sharp and had already gone to the E to put it down. Then you just have a clear C major sound rather than that blurry sound. You don't want that. And then other another mistake that some people make is that they hold the pedal down all the way through the measure because the harmony doesn't change. But then of course what that does is it takes out that rest. It obliterates that rest in the left hand. So we've got to make sure that the left hand has a half note that we can hear and then a rest that we can also in a way hear. We need to be able to hear that silence. So I see um, sometimes people hold the pedal down all the way through and they take out that rest. The other thing I sometimes see is that people will play their hand uh, for, uh, for two beats, they'll take it off, but the pedal's still down. Well, it doesn't count if your hands come off, but your foot doesn't. So you have to coordinate all of that together. The other thing that I sometimes see is that people just hold their hands down for three beats. Uh, they just hold them down all the way through the measure. I see that an awful lot. So you really wanna make sure, of course, to have the foot and the hand coordinated so that on the beginning of beat three, they both come off so that we are just left with that G in the right hand, okay? You don't even have to use the pedal there. I think you can get away without using it, but there are plenty of places where you might wanna use the pedal. Just make sure that a scale like in measure eight is not one of them. Uh, that sounds more like Debussy to me or Ravel than it does like Mozart. So when we have scale passages like that, we definitely don't want to use the pedal, and we certainly wouldn't want to cover over those left hand rests either. So for a couple of reasons, we don't want the pedal in a place like that. Uh, there are other places in, in pieces by Beethoven that I'll, I'll, I'll show you one in a little bit. But I wanted to show you something else having to do with the pedal in this Mozart sonata. This is the A minor sonata, a very famous one. And someone played this for the competition. Uh, and here, if you know, this is uh, at the start of the development. And if you notice here on our last line, I'll just move it up to the top of the page. Uh, we have this um, forte on the downbeat. And then we have a piano marking in the next, uh, in the next eighth note. Now, if you hold your pedal down all the way through that, it's going to be really hard to hear the difference between the forte and the piano because your pedal is going to hold that forte sound over and it's going to ring. And so it's going to be very hard to get that you're trying to make a piano sound. So if you were to pedal here, and you don't even have to, but if you were to pedal here, you'd really need to change it on the end of B1. So I just changed it there. so that you, you get that real dynamic change. If you don't do it, you get this. It's very hard to hear that, um, that change of dynamic. The other thing that's interesting about this passage, I think, is that um, 
here you have a melody that's falling. It's going from B flat down where it's like that. And if you hold the pedal down, the note that you hear the most is the high note. That's partly because we're playing it loud, but it's also part of how our ears work. We tend to hear higher pitches as being the most important pitches. And so that works out okay if our melody's going up. We still hear that next melody note as, okay, that's the most important thing. We hear that melody very clearly. But if the highest note was earlier, it just sounds blurry. And it's harder to catch that melody. So you want to be careful, too, that when you have, um, in, in certain pieces, when you have a descending melody, when it's going downwards, you're going to probably have to pedal more often than if you have a melody that's going upwards. Even if the harmony is like here, the harmony doesn't change in beats one and two, but we have to change the pedal anyway, uh, because it's not just about the harmony. So um, you just have to be careful about those kinds of things. It, you'll have to pedal more often as the melody comes downwards rather than when it just goes upwards. Okay, so that's a little bit about pedaling in Mozart. In Mozart, really, the way that I pedal is actually very similar to how I would pedal in Bach or Scarlatti. I use the pedal to connect two notes together that I really can't quite connect with my hands. And sometimes I'll use it to get a little bit of a bigger sound. Uh, if I'm trying to make forte and it works out okay in the passage, I will put the pedal down and that'll give it a more ringing sound. That's fine. But as long as it doesn't blur anything. But uh, in general, I, I do pedal a lot in Mozart. I use the pedal a lot but I use it for a really, really short amount of time. It, I, my foot is usually just down for barely a 16th note. If you saw my foot when I play Mozart, it just goes like this. It's just flitting like up and down really quickly. And I don't hold it down like I would for say Chopin. Uh, so it's it, it, they're gonna be very quick pedals. So sometimes I hear people that pedal too much. And then other times I hear people that don't use any pedal and neither one sounds quite right to me. So um, something to consider. Now let's go to the next piece. Just a second. Okay, so here we get to Beethoven. And here we have the same kind of thing as in the Mozart. This is in the Pathetique Sonata. And we have at least one person play this uh, in the competition. And uh, we have a couple different movements from this piece actually. Uh, but this is from the first movement. And if you look here, I'll move it to the top of the screen. If you look here at measure 111 here, it's the second measure of this line here. We've got something similar in a way than what we have in the had in the Mozart. We have one harmony in the measure. And the next measure, ditto, one harmony. And so what you hear a lot of people do, so just hold the pedal down for the whole measure. Because they've been holding the pedal down for the other measures before that. They've been holding it down at least for two beats because it's usually the harmony changes every two beats. But um, that doesn't work so well in measure 111 because of the rests. Even in Beethoven, you wanna make sure that you can hear the rests. So that means that the hand has to come off on beat two, but so does the foot. If we don't, it just sounds, it sounds very continuous and there's not a lot of definition to the sound. Now we get used to hearing that a lot because it's sort of how a lot of people play. I don't think it's quite correct. I think if Beethoven had wanted that sound to continue through, he easily could have written a whole note in the left hand for that A flat and for the B flat in the next measure, but he chose to write quarter and then three beats of rest. So it's much better to put that pedal down for just beat one. Then you get some resonance on the downbeat. It's a very exciting sound, but you also get clarity, which is so important. So be really careful in Beethoven too. It's not just in Mozart or Haydn because they're early classical composers that we have to be careful. In Beethoven as well, we have to be super careful that we don't pedal through rests. This is just one example from this uh, sonata, but there are so many in this sonata. I know because my students play them and I just sit there circling rests <laughs> among doing other things as I listen, but I just circle rests that I'm not hearing. And so there are many rests in this piece that you have to be careful of. So if you're playing a piece from this time period, go through and make sure that we can hear the rests and that your pedal isn't completely obscuring them because it's really important. 
Okay, now uh, I wanted to talk about something that happens in Beethoven that's actually kind of interesting. Just need to bring my screen down a little bit so I can move things. Um, and that is that Beethoven in particular really liked to experiment. I'm just trying to see if I can expand this and it doesn't want to let me, of course. Um, he really loved to experiment with the pedal. We'll look at a couple of examples of this. Some of these you might know. Uh, you might know very clearly. This example is from the Tempest Sonata, the D minor. And this is from the first movement. And here at the Largo, he has the pedal marking. You have the pedal marking here on this rolled chord. And then he has you carry it all the way through until the Allegro starts, which is something that most composers before Beethoven wouldn't have dreamed of doing. It's a very new thing that was sort of forward looking on his part. So if you do it, if you hold the pedal down, it sounds like this. And we have another Largo at the bottom of the page, which is even more interesting because the harmonies get much more um, clashing. We have C major as well as D flat major. So I'm not exactly sure how much comes through on Zoom and how much you can hear of the blurring that I'm hearing in the room. It's a lot, um, and that's fine. Um, it's, it's, um, it's an experiment that he was doing, and it's really exciting, and it's different. And any time that you hear this piece in a recital, it's kind of neat when you get there. But sometimes I wonder if we should be doing exactly what he has written, to just put the pedal down all the way. Um, because we're playing a really different instrument that Beethoven had. Um, I, he probably couldn't have even dreamed of the modern concert grand piano. I think he would have loved it but because it, because it makes a huge amount of sound, but it's very different from the piano that he had. So sometimes I like to try to experiment with using just some of the pedal. So, you know, um, I'm always trying to tell my students that with pedal, it's not all or nothing, no pedal or all pedal. There are many different gradations of pedal. In fact, in Russian, in the Russian school of piano playing, there are ten. They have ten different levels of pedal. So I don't get that um, specific with it. I usually have about four levels of pedal. So I talk sometimes about three quarter pedal, or half pedal, or a quarter pedal, and that just means, like, say, if if I say, you know, try doing half pedal, it just means putting your foot halfway down the pedal. And what that does is it does catch some of the sound like the pedal normally would, but it doesn't catch quite all of it. And it doesn't make it reverberate quite so much. And to me, that catches a little bit of what Beethoven was probably wanting from his, his uh, piano. Um, there's another example. And let me see if I can find that. Just need to move down again. The Zoom uh, dashboard is at the top of the screen and it's right in the way of where I need to be for these pieces. Here's another really famous example. It's from the third piano concerto in the second movement. Let me see if I can just move this down. It gets stuck sometimes on Zoom. Oops, like now. Let's see if I can move the Zoom dashboard, can I? Yes, good. Okay, now I should have access to everything that I need. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so here is the very start of the second movement of the third piano concerto. And here is an even more obvious example. Again, I don't know how much will come through on Zoom, but if you were to try this at your home, you'd, you'd see what I'm talking about. The pedal goes down on the first bar and it gets hold all the way through the first three bars, even though we have a lot of different harmony changes. And 
then he goes on like that, and the next two phrases the same thing. Definitely a lot of blurring there. And then the next phrase, all under one pedal. All of that, all one pedal. So it makes you think if you're playing this on a modern piano, it makes you think that you're playing Debussy or Ravel or something like that. But you don't usually hear people in a concert hold that pedal down all the way. Sometimes they will change the pedal a little bit or they will do what I was talking about before where they will use a half pedal. There are even some uh, experts who think that Beethoven meant for the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata, which I know several of you played for the competition, that some people think that he actually meant for that entire movement to be played with you holding down the pedal and not changing it at all. So I definitely wouldn't recommend that on the modern piano. I would definitely change the pedal as often as we normally do in, uh, in our normal way of playing. But it is interesting what that sounds like on Beethoven's uh, kind of piano. I, a couple of weeks ago, tried to play the whole first movement of the Moonlight without changing the pedal on a piano from 1805. It was a Broadman, that, that's the, the maker of it, was Broadman. And that's the kind of piano that Beethoven had, one of them that he had. And it's amazing. Uh, there, the sound is, is this much smaller sound. They didn't have the big sound that we have on our modern pianos. And boy, it's just amazing that um, it creates a beautiful atmosphere. There's a little bit of haze in the sound, but it doesn't blur like it would if we held down the pedal for an entire movement of a piece. It's a really magical effect. And um, so it makes me wonder if maybe Beethoven did mean for that to happen. But for us on a modern piano, we do have to make some adjustments. And so th those are some places where we do sometimes have to either go against what the composer wrote or maybe rethink it just a little bit. Now, if we were to go to another composer, to Chopin, here we have a composer where we definitely are gonna be using the pedal an awful lot more than we would have, certainly in the Baroque period, but even in the classical period too. Chopin called the pedal the soul of piano. And so it was very important for him. And in Chopin, we're often um, taught to pedal for the harmonies. So every time you change the harmony, you change the pedal. And that works an awful lot. We have here the very famous E minor prelude that some of you probably know. And for this piece, we're definitely gonna be changing uh, for the harmonies uh, in the first couple measures. And then I change here in beat three, and then in beat one, and then in beat three and four, and and so on. But there are some times where we don't just need to pedal for harmonies in Chopin's music. There are gonna be times where we need to pedal for the melody as well. In this piece in particular, I think it's important because the piece is um, kind of sparse in the way that it's written. It doesn't have all kinds of flashy notes um, like say the ballads or the sonatas. It's very pure and very clean in a way. And I think we need to try to preserve that. So there are times where we need to be careful where we're pedaling uh, in the melody, particularly when the notes start to move a little bit more. Um, so uh, like if, if I were to jump down to the second line. Here, when the melody changes on beat four, it would really depend the, the pedaling would really depend on the piano that you're in or that you're playing on. Uh, sometimes the A that you play in that melody on beat one will die away enough so that by the time you get to play the B on beat four, you could just keep the pedal down that you have that you changed on beat three and just hold it for beats three and four. But on some pianos, that A might still be pretty loud by beat four. And if it is, then you're probably gonna to wanna to change on beat three for the harmony, but also on beat four for the melody. And certainly when we get 
later in the line, uh, in bar four, bar four of this line, we're going to need to change here on beat two because of the harmony. And beat three, I think, would be good because we've had a couple different melody notes. And beat four, I think we should change because, again, this is a descending melody line. So we're going to change on beat four as well. So that measure has only two harmonies, really, on beat. Beat one is a harmony, and beats two, three, and four are a harmony. And yet we still have to change the pedal quite a bit. Change, change, change. If I don't change, listen to what happens. I'll just change on beats one and two. Again, I'm not sure how much is coming through Zoom. If you try it at home with holding it down, you'll hear there's a lot of blur and it makes the melody sound a little bit less pure than it did before. It's a little harder to know what's, what's happening. So you really wanna be careful about things like that in Chopin. There, this is an example of a place where we have to really be listening to that melody to tell us where else to pedal besides just the harmony changes, because sometimes we are going to need to change more often. But then there are places like in this Chopin Nocturne, it's a one of his really most beautiful nocturnes and most famous nocturnes. I didn't have it turned to the right place, so just give me a second. This is the D flat major nocturne. And here, uh, Chopin's creating a really special mood and uh, having things sort of get uh, lost in a bath of pedal is exactly what's called for. So I'm gonna start at the off tempo at the end of this first line. This is part way through the piece. And we're gonna see that the have, holding the pedal down, regardless of what the melody is doing, is really uh, very special. change the pedal here. I held it down all that time. I'm holding it down here and then I change. But even through all of this, each three notes is a different harmony then it's a really beautiful progression. But if I were to change uh, at each of those chord changes, it would sound like this. It sounds a little bit dry and a little bit clinical. So it sounds so much nicer the way it's marked. Now that kind of pedal would be unthinkable at Mozart's time, but for Chopin it really was. And he has some places too, like uh, at the end of the piece where the pedal, the way it's used is just magical. Just look at the third to last measure here. This one that has dolcissimo marked. Not only do we have six in the left hand, and seven in the right hand, which gives us this feeling that we're not quite tied down in the rhythm like we normally would be. But he has the, this floating line going up and it's all under one pedal. It creates this really dreamlike atmosphere that's really special. So that's an example where we can't think the way we would have in Mozart, certainly not in Bach, and e even not quite the way that we would have thought in that E minor prelude. We have to just go with that wash of sound because it's part of the atmosphere. It's part of the mood that Chopin is trying to create and that we have to be receptive to. So it's really important. Just a couple more to look at. Uh, not that one, actually. Um, I was just going to show you the Chopin uh, fourth ballade just to show you that his writing gets so complicated and harmonically it changes so quickly that the pedal, even in Chopin sometimes, is gonna to have to be a flutter pedal where you just change really, really, really rapidly. Every you know, half second, you're gonna be changing. And that 
that certainly is the case there. I also wanted to show you an example from WC because I think that sometimes people, we, well, we get a little bit confused about how should we pedal. We know that in WC and Ravel and some of these other composers from that time period in the early um, 20th century in France, they like to use a lot of pedal. And so we're not quite sure, well, when to pedal and when not to pedal. And sometimes I hear people pedal um, in a way that, that sounds very nice and resonant. Some people change the pedal too frequently, believe it or not. And it's confusing sometimes because these composers often don't give us any indica indication of where to pedal. They don't put a pedal marking down saying hold until here and then release. It would be helpful if they did, but they don't. So um, you have to look sometimes at what the composer gives you. A composer like Debussy or Ravel, in this case Debussy, this is from Lille Joyeuse, which someone played in the competition, so I thought I'd show it. Um, in, in this piece, Debussy is layering sounds like he so often does. He has a couple of different musical ideas going on. He has this kind of fluty part at the top. He's got almost like a guitar strumming uh, here in the left hand. And then he has this E octave that just sort of chimes here and it chimes there. And most of the time, what I hear people do is they try to have a little bit of clarity in the left hand here. After all these quick notes, they change the pedal on beat two, which sounds like this. I'll play it a little slowly. And then they change right here, which sounds very clear for the left hand. But what happened to that E octave? There's no way with all that I'm doing, high and low in the keyboard, that I can possibly hold that. So Debussy is telling us right there, guess what? You have to use the pedal for the whole measure. Otherwise that E is gonna be lost when you change the pedal on beat two, or if you change it on beat three, it'll be lost there. So that's a great indication that regardless of all the stuff that's going on, even if it sounds like it might even be different harmonies at times, we're supposed to hold it down for the entire measure. So here it is with the pedal held down to allow that E octave to sound throughout the entire measure. And then in the next measure too. Now there's a lot of resonance there. And some people think, uh-oh, that sounds like too much. But to them, you see it, didn't, it, it wasn't that way. It was uh, much different. So he, that's what he wanted there. And there are other places too. This is just one example in this piece. There are others. Here's another one, here a couple pages later. And there are scads of these examples all through his writing and also oftentimes in Ravel's. But here, if you look at this passage, we've got a long low bass G and it's gotta be held for one, two, three, four, five, six measures. And most of the time, people like to change the pedal with the melody so that it sounds clear. And, but then what happens, I'll do that. And then see if you can hear the bass notes still. It's very clear, but the bass is gone. So here's another indication of WC that he wants you to put the pedal down so that you can hold that. So you get the idea that you've got to hold that pedal, even if you hear that blur. It actually makes kind of a magical effect when you do what he wants. So that's just another example in WC where that you've got to be really careful to look at the score and ask yourself, am I doing what he wanted? He wanted those sounds to continue. Um, it, you know, did I make them continue? Now, some people that are used to using the middle pedal uh, on a modern concert grand piano, they would say, well, couldn't we just use that middle pedal? Which, uh, if, for those of you who know how to use it, you're, you're aware that we can put that pedal down right after we play a chord, and it'll hold just that chord. And then you can go ahead and, and clear the, the regular right pedal uh, as often as you want. That's something that a lot of modern composers use and it's very effective. 
But at Debussy's time period, most of the pianos did not have that. If you look at the pedals, uh, the, the pianos of his day, they only had the una corda pedal and the right pedal, so the sustaining pedal. They didn't have the middle pedal. So, you know, yes, we could use it, but that wasn't even something that Debussy had in mind. So he was thinking more about like this whole resonance of the piano rather than just a, a selective thing to, to hold a selective resonance. So that's why one of the reasons why I like to not use the sostenuto or the middle pedal uh, in, that, uh, in that place uh, or in places like it. The other reason that I don't love it is because sometimes on pianos that you go to perform on, it's broken. That pedal is often broken on pianos. And so if you don't know what you're getting into, you might have this grand idea that you were gonna use and then it won't work because the pedal is simply broken. It's a sad fact, but it, it is a fact. Now, for those of you who are used to like having, having an upright piano at home, maybe you might have a middle pedal that presses down into the left and then it dampens everything really quietly so that you can practice without sort of bothering other people. It's a totally different thing than what I'm talking about. That's also an extraordinarily helpful uh, pedal makes it very kind for people around you um, for all the sound, but um, it's a very different uh, kind of thing entirely. But if you get the chance to try that pedal on a modern concert grand, you should try it because it's really interesting. But you do have to make sure that you play the chord and then put the pedal down before you release your hands and then it will work. Okay, so those are a couple of examples from different pieces. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about too, is the una corda pedal. And the una corda, of course, is on the left and um, it makes things quieter. Now in your videos, I would say that most people probably didn't use the una corda. And there are many pieces that don't call for it at all and where it's just fine to not use it. But you should be aware that it can help to get those quieter sounds that you might want. You just have to be careful because some una cordas are really nicely refined so that they make uh, the sound dim a little bit. It's just not, as, not quite as loud. But some unicordas actually change the whole sound of the piano in, in a way that's maybe not great. It uh, really makes the whole piano sound sort of dull and muffled. And if that's not the quality of sound that you want, then you have to know that. And you have to then try to find a quieter sound just by controlling how much arm weight that you're using in the keys or how much um, uh, speed that you're playing with your fingers. So you just have to be aware that some una quarters are really great and they just make things a little quieter and others just sound like the whole piano has been wrapped in a quilt. And then all of a sudden, like the beautiful quality of the instrument is gone. So you don't want to get stuck um, in a concert and concert relying where you were expecting to rely on that una corda and then suddenly it just doesn't really give you the effect that you want because you just never know what you're going to walk into with a new piano to be honest and um, as you go through and do um, music of the 20th century and the 21st century you'll see composers experimenting a lot with pedals a lot of them will use that middle sostenuto pedal and some of them will try other things. I once had to play a piece where I had to play all three pedals at once. And you think, well, how on earth did you do that? Because obviously I don't have, well, you can't see, but I don't have three legs or three feet. So I had to um, play the una corda plus the sostenuto pedal with my left foot. And I had to sort of angle it <laughs> to the side so that I could actually touch both at the same time. But you'll see all kinds of different ways to experiment. One thing that I didn't talk about is doing a pedal decrescendo, which is important if you've got a decrescendo in a piece, but you're supposed to say hold down the pedal because the harmony is all one thing. Sometimes you may want to just um, let the pedal up a little bit. We talked about like three quarter pedal and half pedal and that kind of thing. You might start with the foot all the way down and then gradually make your way up a quarter of the way and then a half of the way and then three quarters of the way up till there's just a little bit of sound left resonating, but not all of it. Help you to create a decrescendo where sometimes if you, um, if you just hold the pedal down all the way through and try to do a decrescendo, it won't really come across to the audience because your pedal is just catching all that resonance from before 
and, and it's not allowing you to do that. So that's another option is to have a pedal decrescendo to make things quieter. So there are a lot of different ways that you use the pedal and it depends on the piece, the time period, the composer and the effect that you're trying to get. So are there any questions? We've just got like three or four minutes. Are there any questions? Let me just check the, the chat to see if there were any, but it, feel free. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Otherwise, we'll go on, I think, to comments. Maybe not, maybe no questions, that's fine. Fang Fang, shall we go on to the comments now? Yeah, I think now I can go on to a comment, yeah. Okay, great. So um, what we will do is I'm just gonna uh, talk with each of you uh, about your, um, your performance. Thank you so much for sending your videos. I was so delighted to get to listen to all of you. Um, you're all incredibly talented, gifted. I can tell that you've put in a lot of work uh, to, uh, to get these pieces to where they are. And I'm very glad to see that. And I hope that you'll continue all of your hard work that you've done because I think we, you know, we all have potential. And what is sad is when people don't uh, achieve that potential. So I hope that you'll all work very hard so that you can achieve as much as you're capable of doing and going as far as you can. I'm going to also stop screen sharing so that we can see each other if we need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first, first is Yi Ning Han. You can call the name. I mean, I can, OK, just yeah, give me Yi one Han. second to yeah. get to my mm. comment sheets, and okay. then I will be all set. OK, so Yi Ning Han. Hi. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your bit. You played the Beethoven Moonlight Third Movement, right? Love yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, great. You played with such nice energy. I really like that a lot. So, and you had obviously you. put a, a lot of work and you had a really exciting performance. I thought that was really great. So I enjoyed it very much. Um, for all of you, and the comments that I'm gonna add, sometimes they may just be echoing something that a teacher has said. Maybe it'll be something that's actually different than a teacher has said. Uh, but I'm just throwing out some comments that I hope will help to bring the performance up to a new level. Um, so just consider them. And you will also get these comments in writing, I believe, from the competition. So um, if you don't catch everything the first time around, you should have a chance to later too. But I'll try to make it fairly clear. Um, in, in, your, um, in the passage work, in the right hand, you know, the, the 16th notes, um, try for even more evenness of fingers. Sometimes it sounds like the volume of the fingers is different. Like I sometimes heard, which made the line kind of sound like it went in and out just a little bit. Not as much as I just demonstrated right there, but if you can try, oops. to create a real intensity of the line with each note, just sort of building on what the last one did. That'll be really uh, effective, I think. Um, otherwise your, your finger work was, was rhythmically very even, but it just, it was the volume that I wanted to have a little bit more consistent all the way through. Also, when you have the, um, the oscillating parts in the left hand, like in measures 23 and 24, let me see if I have the score handy. One second. 23 and 24. Oh, yeah. So when you have like the uh, all of that, sometimes it just, I could hear more of one finger than of another, like sometimes more of the fifth finger or sometimes more of the thumb. So just try to make sure that 
that we hear a real evenness of note. Otherwise, sometimes it sounds like sounds are going from in and then going out and going in. So we want that consistency of sound. It's kind of more related to my first comment, but it's just here in the left hand. Um, a tiny thing um, in at the end of bar 42, finish that phrase before you go on. I think that's a, it's so quick, but if we can have a real feeling of, of a finishing and then going on, it'll be really nice. Otherwise it sounds like a bit of a run on sentence to just have uh, try to really show us that one phrase ended and the next phrase starts. That'll be really nice there. And uh, I wanted to tell you, and most, most this goes for just about everybody, I would say, um, when you have a piano dynamic or even like a mezzo piano or pianissimo, really challenge yourself to get even quieter. Because I found that most, uh, most people tend to stay in the mezzo piano and above range but there are so many moments in our pieces where the composer calls for piano and I feel like we don't quite reach that. So I would just go through your piece and make sure, just circle all the pianos and try to get all of them to be just a little bit quieter. Maybe you'll wanna use the una corda for a pianissimo. You'll experiment with that, but really challenge yourself to get even quieter because I think that you know it's not easy. It takes a lot of control, but there's an amazing intensity that we can find in the piece when things suddenly get hushed and get quiet. People start to listen in a different way than if we're constantly playing out at them. So allow them to come to you a little bit by, by dropping the dynamic a little bit more. Okay, uh, let me see here. What else do we have? Uh, da, 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 da. Some of these comments you can just read um, when it gets, when they get sent to you. Um, and there are a lot of just like tiny little things, um, like in measure 199, let's see. I can find that. Measure 199, oh yes. Um, this is after your torrent of uh, 16th notes and so on. You finish with a C, uh, C sharp octave. It's not marked staccato. So make sure you don't play it too short. Really allow that to ring for the full quarter note. It's not a long note, but allow it to ring for that full value. And then those final two staccato chords, well, I think you could experiment with a different length of staccato. I remember them being quite short. And that's one way to do them, but I'm wondering what it would sound like if that last one were a little bit longer, just to make the, uh, it sound a little bit more final. You know, if that was still short, that last note, but it wasn't so abrupt that we're kind of left thinking, wait, was that it? <laughs> so I would experiment with the length of your staccato notes in areas, particularly at the end there. And otherwise, I mean, I thought it was really exciting. You'll see a couple of just other tiny little detail things uh, in my comments that'll get emailed to you, I believe. But really, I mean, it's it, you did, did a great job. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, take care. So next, shall we move on to the next? Gracie, Gracie John. Grace John. Hi, Grace. Yeah, Gra Grace, Grace. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Grace. So uh, Grace, you did the Bach Prelude and Fugue in C sharp major, which was very popular this year. and with very good reason. It's one of my favorites. It's really great. And you did Rachmaninoff and Hinostera, right? Yeah. Terrific. Yeah, that was a nice, uh, nice combination of pieces, all very different moods. I like that a lot. That was really good. So um, in the Bach, I really liked your phrasing. And I really liked how you brought out the different lines, whether it was in the right hand or the left hand, the, you really, it was very clear. And I liked how you, you did that. You also had a very steady tempo. And I thought that was that's not always easy in that piece, but you, you did that very well. So that was good. Um, in, uh, let's see, what did I say? Oh yes, in the measures 63 to 76, let me find that. Okay. 
63 to 76. I must have. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, that? Oh, yes. That's for the. Try to make sure that we always hear the first beat as being the strongest. What happened was sometimes the left hand thumb that you play on beat two got a little in the way so that it made the, the stress of the measure sound like it suddenly shifted to beat two. So try to lessen that thumb so that we hear one. And so on, okay? I think that'll be really helpful there. Um, we always have to be careful of our thumbs because they can get out of uh, out of control easily. Um, in the fugue, just a tiny thing. In measure thirty-eight, uh, 38. oh yes, that's where you have your trill. I think you play just like a quick ornament. You might try to extend that trill all the way through the measure, all the way through. I believe you just played like the first couple of notes. And it's, it's not easy to play the whole thing, but I would try it because I think it would sound really nice if you could do that trill all the way through. Okay, the, the articulation was so crisp and I really like that. You paid a lot of attention to detail. Now in the Rachmaninoff, um, I wrote, oh yes, in the 32nd note passages uh, where it, it, you, know, you have those faster notes, try to play in larger gestures. What I was hearing was it sometimes sounded a little note to note to note. And I think Rachmaninoff really wants bigger gestures. So don't, don't allow the music to get noty. Try to go for the bigger feeling and the bigger phrasing. And even the same in the 16th notes in the right hand at the end. Let me just pull out my score here. Oh yeah. I love this prelude, it's so nice. But when you get to the end and you're, is near the end and you're going. Even that, it just felt a little too uh, pointillistic to me. Try to go for a I want each note to sort of melt into the next note, you know, rather than being so clear. So try for that. I think that would be a really nice uh, effect. And if you can get a quicker trill at the very end. Again, it's not easy, but you know, you don't have to hold that B in the thumb in the right hand all the way through. You can let it go. You can't really see what I'm doing with my hands right now, but I'm just letting the thumb off and then I relax my thumb. And then I focus on trilling, uh, but I keep the hand more close, uh, closed around uh, the fingers that are trilling so that it's not, my hand isn't like spread out and trying to do funny things. That, the hand doesn't like to do that. So just let go of the thumb on the B as soon as you play it and let the, the, the pedal carry that sound through. And then in the heinous era, I thought it was really well prepared, very fun. I just thought, you know, now you know that you can play it, you did it fine. Um, I think you could just let loose a little bit more because that piece is all about passion and fun and freedom. And I just felt like it needed a little bit more of that. And then we would enjoy it more. So you can totally play it, but now just sort of let loose a little bit more <laughs> and have fun with it. And then we will too. All right. Thank you so much. Welcome, Grace. Thank you. So take care. You too. All right. And then should we go to Amy next? Yeah. Amy. Hi. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm good. So you played the Moonlight Sonata First Movement. And also the Bach C sharp major. That was the winner this year for this uh, most popular prelude and fugue, which is great. Um, and, and the Chopin Etude Opus 10 number nine. Okay, so uh, I thought you did a great job. You had a really challenging repertoire and I thought you did a great job. Uh, in general, try to make sure in the beginning of the Beethoven, let's see, where's my Beethoven score? Um, make sure that those triplets stay quieter than the melody. Um, of course, I won't be able to find it. Where did it go? It's so easy for those triplets to get loud, particularly because the first note of most of, of the triplets, maybe all of the triplets is played by the thumb, which is the hardest finger to control most of the time, but really try to be gentle. 
And then when the melody comes in, it needs to be a couple dynamic levels louder than the trip was. It has to be so distinct. Beethoven actually said, believe it or not, that he wanted the melody here to sound like a horn. So he wanted it to be really distinct. You know, it's not something that's like muffled in in the background. So we have to really make sure to bring out that melody and bring down, you might say, the triplets. It's super important there. Okay. Otherwise, I thought the mood that you captured was really nice. Uh, let's see. Oh, just a tiny thing that I'm sure you know. It was probably just a one-time thing that you've probably never done before. But in measure 59, I think you played an F sharp. Yeah, okay. in the right hand. So just make sure you play the G sharp in beat three as well as in beat one. It's hard because it's a big stretch, but if you need to just roll the chord, you know, and use the pedal to help you there because that's a big stretch for most people. It's one thing I didn't mention about the pedal, but you know, that sometimes it's just practically our way to get out of a bind where our hand doesn't fit. You know, the, the notes are too big for what our hands can do. Uh, the other thing is at the very end of the of the first of this first movement here, I would delay the last chord just a little bit. It was very metronomic how you played it, very correct, you know, very much in time. But it doesn't sound very final. So what I would do is I would just wait just a little bit to do what we call placing. Just place that note. Two, three, four. And just, just wait a little second and then play. And I think it'll be really clear for us that, oh, this is the end. And it'll sound more poignant, I think, that way. So that's the Beethoven. And then we had the Bach, C sharp, of course. Um, I really liked your tempo in the prelude. I, I think in the, the prelude in the temp, uh, in the uh, the tempo in the prelude and the fugue is not always easy to set. It's very easy to go too fast early and then to get really um, stuck later because the pieces get hard, both the prelude and the fugue get harder as they go along in some ways. Um, but you did a great job with setting a nice tempo. I thought that was good, and I liked your articulation. It was wonderfully crisp. Uh, and, and very good. Just make sure that at the near the very end, it measures 101 to 102. Let's see if I can find that quickly for you. Oh yeah, um, you have you have the 16th note passage. <laughs> When you got here to the C sharp major, I heard all of the notes sustained. Make sure that you keep them as distinct as the rest. So don't hold, don't keep holding the, the notes down as if they're a chord. Just, just keep it nice and clear because it just didn't match with the way you had played the rest of the piece, which was so uh, clean and crisp. So just a small detail there. And in the fugue, I liked your articulation again. It's not easy there, but it's good. The, the, what I thought was uh, two things. If you could try to vary the dynamics more, find some moments where it could maybe go a little quieter and a little louder. I think that would be nice because it felt like there was a bit of a sameness. And then the other thing is if you could try to find a little bit more of the dance quality that is in almost all Baroque music. It's almost all just based on on Baroque dances. If you could find a little bit more of a dance-like feel to it, um, a little bit more of a lightness, a lilt. It doesn't have to do with tempo necessarily, but it's just a lightness. I think that would be really nice. I think most of us get a little stuck. And this was true of just about everybody who played a piece by Bach. We get stuck trying to get it right. You know, and getting it right is really important. Don't get me wrong. It's very important to get it right. But um, we get, we're, we're so fixated on not messing up or, you know, remembering everything we've got to do or something that it just feels like it's a, a little bit in a box. And if you could feel that dance like feeling and just be expressive in that way, I think the piece would come to life even more than it already was. Because you had all the basic things there in the piece. 
um, that if you could just vary the dynamics a little more and feel a little bit more sparkle in that in that dance like character, the, a lightness to it, um, a little bit more joy, I think it would really translate very well. Okay, so you're able to do all the stuff. So now you can just sort of, um, like I was telling Grace, you, you know you can play it. So now just have fun with it a little bit more. Right. And then in the Chopin etude, um, you did a great job with the difficult jumps in the left hand. That's not, that can be really awkward, but you made them sound easy. So bravo for that. Uh, when you have quieter dynamic like piano and pianissimo, try to find an even quieter sound because it sounded like we kind of got to mezzo piano and that was about where we bottomed out. And I'd love for you to find some quieter um, dynamics. Experiment with using the unicorda as well. That could really help for the very quietest moments. Um, and in, uh, let's see, where's my Chopin score? Give me one second. In measures 33, you have to find your etude. Okay, in measure 33. Oh yes, that's where you have those very, it's marked appassionato. <laughs> You got those octaves and the big jump. If you could go for broke a little bit more there and just go more with the with the feeling of appassionato, I think it'll be really exciting. It just felt a little bit careful. Like I know I have a big jump here, and <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm just gonna make sure I get the jump. And I'm glad you did, but that you made it. But I I want to just to feel like wow this is overwhelming. You know what what passion you know. And there was another place too in 61. It's the same kind of thing. He doesn't mark a passionato there, but it's the same kind of thing just later in the piece. And I think it's absolutely called for there. I just felt like um, emotionally, the piece could go further in the extremes. You know, you could be more like wildly passionate in a few places. Um, and then also more reserved and quiet in the, in, the true, in the truly quiet moments. I think that would be great. Also, there are some accelerandos mark, two of them. Try to do a little bit more if you can. I know it's not easy. What he's given you to do during the accelerando, just note wise, is really hard. But if you could accelerate a little bit more, and I think you can, that will make that um, what comes after the accelerando that much more interesting and exciting. Great job. Really very nice. I was glad to hear it. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. Take care. Okay, is Kelly next? Is it Kelly? Hi. Kelly, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, I'm doing well, thanks. So you did so well. I was glad to hear you did Beethoven Moonlight, first movement, C sharp major Bach, that's the winner, and uh, the Chopin Etude Opus 10 number five. Really nice choice of pieces. So, very nice variety, which I really liked. Um, I, and I thought you'd done a lot of great work. So con congratulations for that. Now, in the moonlight, first movement, you had beautiful tone. I really like that. I thought that helped you to capture a really beautiful mood. So I like that a lot. Um, in that moonlight, same as before, as I was saying before, try to always keep the triplets at least one or two dynamic levels lower than the melody so that it can really sing out. It needs to be poignant and not... Um, and not lost. It gets a little bit lost sometimes in the shuffle. So really work on lightening up that right hand thumb in particular, but also the other triplet notes so that they sound very much uh, so they sound very quiet. Okay. I'm kind of imagining my triplets as pianissimo or even triple P and then my melody as something like mezzo piano. So there's really a big difference between them. And of course, we all know that's a challenge because it's just, there's just one hand doing all that. But that's, our, that's what Beethoven's given us uh, right there. That's our particular challenge. But I know that you can, if you just work on that a little bit more, you'll we'll be able to hear that melody come out and that triplet figuration won't get to the forefront all the time. So that was one thing um actually that was that was my main comment for the moonlight because it was really quite good otherwise um okay so the the c sharp major prelude and fugue i loved your articulation in the prelude it was wonderfully crisp i thought that was really nice um i 
thought though that, especially in the longer phrases that you have, that maybe having a little bit more dynamic contrast would be nice. And I thought like, for example, there's one thing you can do in measure 87. That's the start of a long sequence. It's sort of, he, he, he's been all over the place and then he kind of comes back down and, and then things kind of grow from there. And I thought if you got quiet there at 87 where he starts, like, you could then have a little bit of a, of a crescendo and that might be very nice. So, uh, and, and, then, and then that would carry you through to the end, to a nice forte at the end. So you, you did a nice forte at the end, but I felt like if you had come down quieter in that moment, that you would have had further to go and it would have been a little more um, exciting. It would have drawn us in just a bit more. So if you could do that, I think that would be fun. In the fugue, I said, overall, very good work. It's a very difficult fugue. So anyone who plays it well has really accomplished a lot because I, I find it to be a tricky one. But I think for you, as I mentioned before to someone else, a more dance-like feeling would be really nice. Um, as I demonstrated, just feeling a certain lightness to it and also more variety of dynamics as well. Finding places where you can get quieter. Uh, sometimes there's like a harmonic progression where there'll be like a certain thing that will happen uh, a couple of times in different keys or in different harmonies. You can start quiet and then grow or just find ways to vary things a little bit more. I think if you look in the score, you'll be able to find some places that would be appropriate to get a little bit quieter. So hopefully that makes sense. But otherwise, I mean, I thought you did, I thought you did a very good job. It's again, it's this feeling of, well, we're trying to get this Baroque music really correct. And then when we do, um, sometimes we lose out on the, the incredible fun and the spirit of the music, which I think is really important. So, but it's the kind of thing you have to give yourself permission to do that because otherwise it's just so easy to just kind of try so hard to just get it right. Um, and there is so much to do in that fugue. Uh, the, the just, you know, so many uh, hurdles to jump over pianistically that it's very easy to get in that mindset. But if you can think a little more freely, I think it'll be great. Okay, and then in the show pan, I'm gonna get some water. We thought, you have good articulation in the right hand and a sparkling sound, which is so important in this piece. It really does have to be brilliant sounding. Um, in the, uh, let me just pull it out. Oh yeah. Uh, in the, make sure that the tempo of the piece and also the uh, where you're stressing in each measure, make sure that it doesn't make the piece sound as if it's a 4-4 four, four piece or as if it's, there are four uh, beats per bar, let's say. Um, it sounded a little to me like each beat felt a little bit too the same. Instead, if you could think one and two, one, two, two, one, two, two, a little bit more of that feeling of one and two, so that beats one and two are really strong and uh, the ands of one and two are a little bit less strong. I think that that'll really help. It'll give the piece more of a sense of flow and will help it to not feel quite so heavy because it really should be a very light and bubbly kind of piece, you know? And I think that if you can think of that, maybe bring the tempo up just like a click, one click on the metronome, just see if that is possible, you know, and keeping the control that you need, you know, just see if that's possible. I think that might help too. Cause I just felt like the piece needed to flow a little bit more and we needed to feel the bigger beats. Okay. Good, I thought it was very nice. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. You too. So next, I think, is, is Michael Shu. Is that Michael next? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Michael. How Hello. are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So um, very talented. I was really glad to hear you, as I was to hear everybody. I thought you did a great job. You did some Rachmaninoff, uh, the Chopin Nocturne also. I thought that was great. So um, let's just talk about a couple of things. Because you're so talented. You've already done such good work. Um, let me just pull out my Rachmaninoff score. So I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so in the Rachmaninoff prelude, so much fun to hear this piece. Um, 
Oh, yes. So you have a wonderful energy. I really like that, You, which is such an important thing here in yeah. this piece, to have an energy and an intensity, and you do that really well. Something for you to think about, though. In measure 23, that's where we have uh, where we have that wonderful D octave, and then the chords up high. Um, right now, you're making a wonderful piano. You're drawing back dynamically, but you're also drawing back in tempo. And because you do that, I feel like you lose some intensity. Okay. And I think feel like you've built so much up and then you just give it away. And so if you could just uh, keep that tempo that you've had. And then uh, onwards, downwards too. Keep it all in tempo, but just do those things that you were trying to do only with dynamics. I think you will actually find that you have more intensity and that you won't uh, drop. Uh, the intensity right there. I think it'll be nice. And I know you can do that. You know, you, um, it's not that you couldn't play those chords faster, I'm sure, because you play plenty of fast chords in this piece. So just try that to be in tempo and then, uh, and, but starting as quietly as you did, because it was very sensitively done as far as that went. I, I like that a lot. And then also, I thought that, oh, I thought in the middle section, you had a wonderful sense of legato line, which is so important in Rachmaninoff. And I thought you handled the voicing, which is so important there too. So you handled that really well because there, there's some wonderful inner lines. That's just a uh, such a hallmark of Rachmaninoff style. Uh, it's really very nice. So I like that a lot. Um, in the end, so just that very last line uh, that's pianissimo, I thought that you could try for an even quieter sound. I think that would be really effective. Uh, you know, this piece has been so intense and it's kind of a surprising ending in a way. We expect it to end really big, but it feels like the piece just kind of evaporates or floats yeah. away, like a balloon, you know, the helium balloon that just yeah. floats away. Um, and I think that if you could find an even quieter sound for that ending, it would be really effective to bring home what's actually happening in the piece, which is that it is sort of evaporating, you know, going up, up, up and away. So there would be a place for the unicordo, I think. Okay. And um, and just try for the quietest sound that you can that you can safely control there. I think that okay. would be really nice. uh, then in the Chopin Nocturne in C minor, I thought, I thought that was also a nice repertoire choice. Let me get out my Nocturne. Um, oh, I uh, in this there's the sotto voce section. It starts at measure 25, and that's a really um, it's almost like a hymn there. You know, it's very it's like a chorale. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, if you could, it's more sotto voce, so it's like whispered. I think right. that you could find an even quieter sound there too. Um, that's a that's a hard thing sometimes to capture, but if you could capture a really glowing um, and yet very interior sound, I think that would be really nice there. Because the beginning of the piece, is it's not loud, um, but it's more direct to me, the way that, that piece starts, bum, bum. It's like it just kind of deposits you right in the middle of the story. And then suddenly he draws back. And I think sometimes we don't really capture that change as well as we could. I think that would be helpful there. Okay. Uh, then going into the transition to the doppio movimento at the, you know, in the, in the last section, right before that, you have this octave passage. He's marked it. He's got a couple things going on. You're supposed to do a sforzando at the first one, and then piano right after. And then you're supposed to do a cello rondo too. So there's a lot going on. And I think that would be, and he's also marked, at least in my edition, it's marked for the pedal to stay down for the whole time. Right. That's one of those places where I think if you do, like, say, either a half pedal the whole time, that that would be better, or put the pedal down all the way for the sforzando and then gradually do one of those pedal decrescendos that I was talking about, where the pedal, as you come up, will, as you come up that passage in the, the left-hand octaves, the pedal will also come up and you'll leave some of the resonance behind without giving all of it away. Right. I think that would be really effective because right now, the way you're playing it right now, you're playing all the octaves, you're playing it very clear, cleanly, but I can't hear them. Okay. And it's because it's, it's low, it's fast, You've played a really loud chord uh, on the on beat three. And so it's hard to sort of hear what else is going on. And I think pedal wise, we just need that clarity. So consider decrescendoing with the pedal 
I think that'll be very effective there. Okay. And we'll get across that, that dynamic marking for sure. Cause it's, you know, Sforzando piano is really hard if the pedal is held down all the way. It's just, yeah. it's actually impossible to do. So I think you're gonna need to change the pedal part way. Okay. Okay, then in the doppio movimento, I think the hardest thing, you, you, you play it really well, but I think the hardest thing is to capture the intensity that he wants without giving up the dynamic that he marks. Right. Because the dynamic is pianissimo. And that seems like that can't possibly be right, right? I need to sing out here. And so nobody plays pianissimo, but I think we lose, and it's also marked agitato. So we think, well, agitated, it can't be quiet and be agitated. But really it's, to me, it's like that, you know, like a tea kettle with the lids on, but that inside, you know, the, the water's boiling and, and bubbling away. There's a lot of intensity, but the lid isn't off yet. The lid will come off later, you know? If you, if you start really quiet, you're gonna give yourself somewhere to go. So that by the time you get to that fortissimo at 72, it's gonna feel pretty epic. You know, it's gonna feel really amazing because of where you've come from. Otherwise this piece can tend to feel loud. Yeah. Just loud, you know, big, it's very big. It's exciting. It's, it's a very different nocturne than any of the others. None of the others have quite this arc and go at quite as many places I feel like. And certainly they don't have all the octaves that you have in this middle section but you do have to find your moments to come back. Right. Otherwise it can just feel like all too much. It feels like a ballade rather yeah. than a nocturne, you know? Okay. So beautiful playing. Those are just my couple of comments for you. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thanks, Michael. Great, good luck. All right, and who do we have next? Is it Gabriel? Uh, yes, hello. Hi, Gabriel. Uh, how are you? Pretty good, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm doing well, thanks. So I really enjoyed your playing. I thought your playing was so refined and so controlled and you've accomplished so much, obviously. It's really great. It was wonderful to hear you. You did the thank Bach you. Partido, uh, which I misspelled in your comments. So you'll see that, that I was writing quickly. And you did Lists di Lorelei, which was a nice choice and kind of unexpected. And then Bartok Romanian Dance. That was great. Okay, so I liked it all really very much. Um, I just had a couple comments, but I thought your the clarity of the voicing was so nice in the Bach. I thought it was just so crystal clear, and I thought that it was um, very thoughtfully done. You really had thought through all the everything, you know, and and it was that was very nice. Thank you. But just one thing about the Allemand, and it's a tricky thing, but never forget that the movement is in cut time. It's right, really right, easy right. for this movement to to get to feeling like it's a four four uh, movement, but it's not. And there were moments, particularly on the first page, where I felt like it was in 4-4. Four, four. So I just go through and make sure that you're really feeling the two big beats per bar all the way through the piece. I think that'll be fine. It's really great otherwise. And in the Capriccio, I love the energy. You had terrific energy and crisp articulation, which is exactly what that movement needs. You had a lot of control at that tempo. But I was just wondering if you'd consider a slightly faster tempo. I mean, just like maybe one metronome marking faster. I wonder if it's not possible to have all that control at the faster tempo, then don't do it. But I just wondered, because you had such control at the tempo you were playing, I was just wondering, hmm, what would it be like to play it just a little bit faster? I think that that might create something really special. But yeah, you, actually. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was like thinking quite a bit about the tempo at the time. The thing is, I kind of want to keep this staccato touch for all the 16th notes. So I feel like if I play faster, well, it definitely sounds more exciting in many places, but kind of loses the touch. Or like, I don't think my technique is good to keep the touch oh. at the faster tempo. So well, yeah. You, yeah, you definitely don't want to lose your articulation, but I have a feeling if you practiced it, you'd be able to get that. You just have to keep the lightness in the, you, you don't want to get heavy. You don't want to get tight physically as you're trying to do quick staccatos. You just want to keep the lightness in it. Uh, so that you can do that. But I have a feeling you'd be able to. I mean, I'm just talking like one click faster on the metronome. But even if you were to play it again later at the tempo that you did, I mean, it would be great. I just think it would be something to consider at least to, you know, definitely keep everything that you're doing, but just uh, increase the tempo the tiniest little bit. And I think it would be really fun. Right, definitely. I would try that. Yeah. In the Lorelei, which was very nice to hear, you had a beautiful tone and a really nice feel for the piece. I think you got the style and you communicated the story of this song. It's been transcribed, of course, for piano, 
Um, I thought you did that very well. So I like that. Now in the very first phrase, uh, it, which is just a single line, I think you split it between two hands. You did like left and then right, and then you went down and did le the rest in the left hand. To me, visually, that looks not quite as good as just keeping it all in one hand. And I don't think you needed to split it in the right, to, to have the right hand because it was too great of a reach or anything. I think it would be visually kind of uh, nice. And also it would sound, I think, a little more unified if one hand played it the whole way through. So it's, you know, not bad the way you did it, but just consider trying that just in one hand all the way through that first phrase. Um, then now I don't know what uh, edition you were using and the edition that I was looking at did not have measure numbers, which is so fun. Uh, so um, there's a section that's called, uh, that after the words fließt der Rhein, it was on, the you'll see it in the notes, but it's on the second page, the fourth system measure four. Let me just see if I can pull that up really quickly. Just give me like one second. If I can't, then I'll just, I'll just kind of describe it, but I, let me see if I can pull it up quickly. Here it comes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Second page, fourth line. Yes. After the words fleeced der Rhein, uh, make sure that you replay the G sharp at the end of the measure because you've got uh, the measure is. And it sounded like the G sharp that should have been in the big beat three was just held over and I was like waiting for it. It didn't happen. So make sure you replay that. And then in the next measure, make a difference between the melodic A that you play at the beginning of the measure and then this next A that's part of the accompaniment. To me, it sounded like, oh, there's another melody note, you know, like as if there was a melody note on the big beat two in that measure and there isn't. So just make sure that you sing out the first one and then the second one is more in the background. Right. Uh, actually, for the first G sharp, I think on my score it says it's a tie note for the first oh, repeat, really? but then for the G major part, like when the G major, when the melody appears again later in G major, I think uh, on that score it's a separate note, I think. Oh, yeah. well, do what's in your score. I wasn't sure what score you were using. All I had was the score in front of me, but uh, it's, it is important to make the melodic notes sound different than the accompanimental notes. And sometimes they are the same notes in the same hand, but it, it's important to make that distinction. Right. In right. the Bartok, uh, Romanian dance, I thought it was very accomplished. I thought you had a great attention to detail. Um, I liked the power that you played with. I thought it was really good. Um, on uh, page six, let's see again if I can pull that up really quickly. Let's see here, can I? Maybe not. I don't think, okay. So let me just tell you, um, on page six, measures one, three, five, and seven, make sure that your 16th dotted eighth rhythm doesn't relax into an eighth note, eighth note rhythm. It just needed to be a little bit more yappa, and it sometimes became ba, ba a little too much. So just check that. When you get the notes from me, you'll, you'll be able to you know, look and see where I was talking about. And then there was, um, oh yes, on page nine, and I, again, I hope we're looking at the same score, but I think for Bartok, there's probably just one addition. Um, in the fourth and fifth systems, try to make it the more clear, the differences between piano, mezzo piano, and mezzo forte. Overall, I thought your dynamics were very good and very clear throughout, but they're in that one spot, to me, they just felt like they were all kind of becoming a little too similar. And I thought the piece lost a little bit because of it. So if you can just try for that excitement and that real precision in the, in the, um, in the dynamics, that it's really gonna help that, uh, that section of the piece come to life more. I, of course, yes. It'll make more sense when you see the comments and can look in the score. But uh, anyway, that was great, great work. Thank you very much. Yeah, so hope to hear you again uh, in the future. I hope to hear all of you again in the future. Um, it would be so nice like in another year to see where you all are, you know, after another year's worth of work 
So uh, that's great. Okay, so who's next? Is it GIE? Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So um, GIE, you did a great job. I really enjoyed it. You're very talented, obviously. You played the first movement of Papatique and you played Rachmaninoff Prelude in E flat, which was nice mm -hmm. to hear. And you played the third Chopin Etude from Opus 10. Very nice. A nice choice of repertoire too. I like that. Um, so I had a lot of like little, not a lot, but a couple of little details in the Beethoven because it is such detail oriented music. Let's see where my Beethoven score went. Oh, there it is. And let's see if I can uh, talk about a couple of them. Just give me one second to find it. Oh yes, so in the first section, I thought you did the first section very nicely, the grave section. Uh, in measure nine, you start measure nine with a sforzando. Be careful that the next measure doesn't sound like it has a sforzando because it, it's not marked in the score. It's so easy to just to start really loud there on that C. Instead, try to make the ultimate difference between the two. The first one is really brash, and the next one could be much more tender. I think you could make more of a contrast there. So be really careful of how you start that first note. And that, that's in measure 10. Again, you'll see the, the comments in writing and that will make more sense. Um, then, in measure 11 through 15, this is the part that we're also uh, aware of. Resist the temptation to put a crescendo in there. We hear everybody do that, but there's actually not one marked. And we do that because, you know, the line's rising, and so it makes sense to do a crescendo. But if you actually um, delay the crescendo until it's marked, it's far more exciting to keep things very hushed and sort of um, uh, percolating inside. Like, so there's the, the, the lid is on the, on the pot a little bit more, like I was mentioning to someone else. Uh, it's much more exciting. And then the crescendo only starts here. If you wait, all of a sudden the crescendo happens really quickly because there's not much time for it. There's just a couple measures. So it's much more exciting and intense. So try to delay that crescendo a little bit more, and I think you'll really have something exciting there. Uh, you'll just be you'll be doing it differently than a lot of other people because most people just kind of assume, hey, the line's going up, so I'll crescendo. But uh, this is a much better way, I think. Okay, then. Oh yes, right at the second ending, after you know the the exposition, you've got the, and you've got that dramatic chord, and you've got a fermata. I think you can hold that for a lot longer. Make us wait, make us wonder what's gonna happen before we come in with the next chord. So just take your time with that and experiment with, you know, how long can I hold that without it seeming too long? I think that would be really good for you to try. And then, oh yes. And then right there at the, at the next measure, if you, you've got an interesting marking there, Beethoven gives us a forte piano all on one chord. Well, what are we supposed to do with that? We're playing all these notes and we're holding them. You know, they, they get a little quieter because it's a it's a piano, you know, the, the sound dies away gradually. But what the other thing that we can do to give a little bit of a sense of the sound dying away a little quicker is if you start that chord with uh, your foot down, you know, put the pedal down. And then as soon as you play the chord, release the foot. And then that takes some of that resonance that you start the chord with, takes it away. It won't take all of it away, but it's kind of the closest thing that we can get to a real forte piano when you can't let go of any of the notes and you can't do anything else. If you let go of the pedal, that will help, okay? So that's one thing you can do to help there. Uh, let's see, what else did I have for you? 
Oh yes, I was talking about this in the uh, in the master class about pedaling. When you have measures like those measures, make sure to release that left hand right on beat two. Same with the pedal; they both have to come off rather than ringing through the measure in kind of a generic way. Really make sure we hear the rest. So important. Okay, and then let's see, measure two eighty one. Oh yeah. So this is, you've just done. Most people come in very strong uh, because we're, we're going on and it's like the, ne the, the second time you've done this phrase and it's more intense. But if you look at what's marked, there's no accent here on the octave. It's still actually supposed to be piano. So really make that the piano. It'll be surprising. And then crescendo on beat three where it's marked. You'll have a more exciting crescendo because again, just like at the beginning, you've waited. You haven't given too much of the crescendo away too soon. So no accent on that octave and then crescendo. Really exciting that way. Okay, great. Now for the rock mono, I have less to say about the others, don't worry. The rock mono off, let's see, where's my score for that? I was glad you played the E flat. Um, it's not done so much, but it's such a beautiful piece. I really love it. So I was glad to hear it again. So in this piece, I said you had a, you played it beautifully. You had a wonderful singing tone, which is so important in Rachmaninoff. So bravo for that. Um, in general, I would say the overall dynamic range that you play the piece with could be a little bit broadened. I think your quiets could be quieter, and I think the louds could be louder too. If you could just sort of sort of expand the dynamics a little bit more, that's going to help us to get more of a sense of an arc in the phrases. Because Rachmaninoff's phrases are known for having a rise and a fall and like a goal point in the phrase. And sometimes I thought we got there, but then other times I thought that the the arc was just a little too small to root for it to really come across to the average listener, you know. Um, particularly someone who doesn't have the score in front of them. So I think, you know, if you could just expand that, then uh, things wouldn't feel quite so miniature. That would be really nice. Also, one tiny detail um, that you probably already know about, but just as a reminder, in bar 21, let's see, in bar 21, Uh, Rachmaninoff has, like he so often does, he has some notes with different stems. The stems go in the opposite direction. It's for um, a, a counter melody that he loves to put those in. Try to bring that out if you can. It's the E flat and the D and the D and the C and the C and then goes back to the E flat. You'll see that the, the, the notes have different stem directions. I think they go downwards and they have tenutos on them. If you can try to bring that out, it would be really special. So there's that. And then let's go into the Chopin, which was also very beautifully done. Let me find my Chopin score. Great attention to detail. And you know, the really difficult parts of this etude um, in the middle section, you made those seem like they were just nothing. <laughs> I thought that was really something. Uh, in the um, earlier than that, starting at, what is it, bar 21. That's where you have the phrases that start like that. And you've got four of them in a row, very quickly. You know, they're just a couple bars each. And if you could make them all sound a little bit different in how they start, they sounded a little bit, with so many of them coming back to back, they become a little bit predictable if you don't do something. Maybe just change the inflection of one. The, the, maybe the speed with which you play that second beat. Just a little bit changing that or changing how much decrescendo you do. It's marked decrescendo each time. You know, just find a way to make it not sound just like, oh, and here we go again. Yeah, da, 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 da. You know, I think that's important there. Good. And I think that was the main thing I think, that, that I had to comment there because it was really very nice. So congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. And then I think next we have Pin. Is that, I don't know if that, I'm pronouncing yes. your name correctly. Hello. 
Hi, Pin, how are you? I'm great. Good. So um, I see it's more, is it morning there where you are? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, good morning. Thanks for waking up with us. Uh, so I really enjoyed your playing pin. Uh, your list ballad was really nice. Uh, you had a beautiful performance, very accomplished. You know, you've done such good work. I thought the phrasing that you had and your voicing that was all just excellent. It was really nice. And I thought you captured the mood of this piece so well. I just have a couple of general comments. Um, like I've mentioned to a lot of other people, try to work at finding quieter piano and pianissimo moments in the piece. There are some there that I think you could go further with, and it would give you a greater sense of variety. It would give the piece a greater sense of traveling further, and it would be really effective, I think, for those of us who get to listen to you. For example, there's the vivo section in measures four to six, the beginning. I think those could be quieter and almost like more distant. There was also, uh, I also wanted to challenge you because you've got the control for, you know, everything that you're doing. It's so nicely done. But um, try to find even more varieties of tone color in the piece. Um, in the ten at the section that's just before the tempo di marcia, that's marked animato, there's a right hand part uh, that is in Brisbane octaves on A flats. You're just kind of traveling up and down the keyboard in A flats. Uh, and let's see if I can find that. I don't play this piece, so I won't be able to play it well. But you've got a melody in the left hand, and you played that so nicely. But I felt like this is a place where Liszt is layering sounds, not in some ways unlike the way WC was layering sounds, you know, where you have one thing and then you have a couple of other things and they're all coexisting. And to me, all of the layers sounded too much alike. I loved what you did with the melody, but I'm wondering if you could find maybe a slightly different sound for those right hand A flats, maybe something that's more bell like but also more distant. Let's see. I think partly just having a more ethereal light sound will be really uh, effective there because they were maybe a little too present for me. It's a small detail, but I think it would really pay off if you looked at that. Um, also, uh, and th that's just one example. If you could work at layering the sounds throughout the piece, I think that would be really effective. Also, notice at the tempo di marcia, uh, right in that, right after that section that I just mentioned, that it's marked piano, but also sotto voce, so it's like whispered. I felt like we missed the opportunity to truly get quiet and to create a very different uh, mood or character in the piece. I think you can, I think you could do that very easily and it would really pay off. It would give us a sense of variety that list I think has written into the piece. We don't wanna miss that. So try for a more hushed uh, sound there. I think it'll actually be really suspenseful and really exciting with what's going on in the piece right there. Now that was good. And then you played two Tchaikovsky pieces, which I thought you did so well. You had a really nice full tone, uh, the playing was very exciting with a lot of rhythmic vitality in the tray pack. Um, just, oh, there was just one thing, because uh, I, I really liked the Tchaikovsky, I thought it was very good. And, um, but, oh, I wanted to, th this is something that I noticed uh, in each piece, and it's something we all do. It's a bad habit for all of us. But when you go for your quieter moments, you telegraph it to us by hunching over the keyboard. Try instead to create the quiet in your in the way you play, the in the sounds that you create, rather than in like a physical change. To me, it actually the hunching over the keyboard actually makes it harder to play well. It, you lose a little bit of control, I think, believe it or not. And it's just it, it's kind of um, well, I know it's a it's a sign to the audience, hey, I'm doing something different. And I think that you should do that with the, the sound that you create and not rely on that sort of physical signal, like, hey, look at me, look what I'm doing different, you know? So it's a it's a habit that we absolutely all of us do at one time or another. But if you can just try to keep a, a nice uh, 
posture that is that is nice and, and upright, uh, regardless of the dynamic that you're playing, I think it'll be much more effective actually in the long run. So keep layering that sound in the list and the Tchaikovsky is really wonderful, very exciting. So congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Enjoy your day. Okay, do we have Yi Cheng next? Yes. Thank you. And thank you for waiting. Thank you, everyone that I haven't spoken to yet for your patience. I appreciate it. I know it takes a while, um, but I want to be able to share with all of you how much I liked your playing and 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 give my my comments. So Yi Cheng, I really enjoyed your playing too. Um, and I thought you 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 did some really great things. And uh, you, you had a nice variety of pieces too, I thought. Um, you had the uh, the Mozart, you had the Chopin etude, and Ville Joyeuse, which was a nice example for me in the in the lecture about pedaling. So in the Chopin etude, I liked your performance. I thought it was very fun, and I thought that you handled the passage work very well. You made it sound you know easy, which is not easy. <laughs> um, be careful, just a tiny thing, just a tiny thing. Be careful. There's one section. It's from measure 57 to 60. Let's see if I can find that quickly here in my score. Uh, in that section, there, there were some times where I felt like the bass note wasn't getting caught in the pedal. I felt like I wasn't hearing it. So like, this is where you're jumping a lot. And I don't know if that was intentional on your part to just have it be very dry. I don't know. But um, usually I'm used to hearing that, that bass note continue through even, I know it's marked staccato, but then there is the pedal marking underneath. And I think you should try to really make sure that you do the, the pedal there and pedal uh, once per beat. And um, to make sure that the, that the bass note that you play at the beginning of the beat gets uh, in the pedal. Sometimes the pedal went down, I think just a little too late. And then we didn't quite catch that, uh, that bass note sound. So just make sure that's just for about four bars that you catch that sound in there. So it's a tiny detail, but I think that it makes a difference there. Otherwise the piece can very easily sound top heavy. You know, there's a lot of right hand stuff going on. And if you don't have anything to ground it in the left hand, it's, it's, it feels like it's missing something. Okay. Otherwise very good. Uh, I liked your tempo in the Mozart. It's a, it's a very gripping and exciting piece. Um, and I thought you, it, this is a easy piece to again, start too fast. But you didn't. Yeah, you, you started at a very nice tempo. Um, so I used um, one of the spots from this movement as an example with the in the the lecture with the, that. That's a, certainly a place where yes, we have one harmony for two beats, but you can't hold down the pedal for that whole time because it will really obscure that forte piano that happens. So we need that to be really clear. So make sure that if you're going to use the pedal, and I'm not convinced you have to. But if you are going to use it there, that you change on the end of one so that we hear the difference between forte and piano. Um, on measure 79, let's see, I'm just trying to see if my score is really handy. Um, was here. See where it is now? Here it is. In measure, oh yes, in measure 79, you come up on a nice E major chord and your right hand has to get off its note, its, its chord really quickly because you've got to start playing 16th notes. But the left hand is actually not so quick. It, it'll make a much more, uh, it'll make a much better impression and it will help to finish that phrase that you've just been on if you hold that left hand note for the full quarter note value and don't pop off it as quickly as the right hand does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just hold that for the full quarter note. It's a tiny detail, but it is important. Also, let's see, I have another. Oh yes, also another place to be careful of your pedal is in measure 127. That's when you're doing. You don't really need a whole lot of pedal there. If you are going to use it, I would flutter. I would just you know, pedal, 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 pedal. I would do a lot of pedals so that you don't carry over too much sound. I think it, it'll sound a little too blurry uh, for us there, a little too Chopin-esque. So overall, very nicely done though. Then in the, okay. and then in the Lille Joyeuse, um, let me just get that out. 
in the beginning, I think you can hold those spermatas for longer in the very first measure, first couple of measures, I think. Uh, let me just see where this is. Yeah, so you've got that trill. I think you should build a sense of excitement. Start really quiet and then crescendo through. And uh, I mean, I, I don't I, I don't really think that we even did a fermata. I think it was just kind of like one, two, blah, 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 blah. and I think you can just have a little bit more fun with that trill. I know sometimes it can feel a little, you can feel self-conscious just trilling, you know, because <laughs> that's the only thing you're doing, but enjoy it because it's kind of this magical start to what is a very evocative piece. So just enjoy this kind of strange beginning and just uh, so elongate those, uh, you know, it's a half note with the fermata, so I would say count at least three beats, but make those three beats wonderfully alive with the crescendo, starting really quiet as if it's like way in the distance and then it gets close and then, and don't be too fast on the 30 seconds. You've actually got more time than you think and you wanna make it more gestural so that we hear it's just like, it's like when you watch um, a hummingbird that just kind of flits around really quickly and goes all over the place or, or like a bug or something that does that. It's that kind of gesture. And if you go too fast, it just seems like, bloop, you know, which is not as interesting as this. So really, you know, go with the gesture a little bit more, take time with it. You've got more time than you think. And you may need to flutter your pedal a little bit too in that 30 second note passage. And all of that, um, you might need to flutter the pedal just a little bit, just for some clarity, because you want it to sparkle and not just sound like mush. You know, that's not so yeah. exciting. Yeah. Then um, uh, I already talked about in the lecture about um, those whole notes, keeping those whole notes ringing with the pedal right before the CD. So it, you'll, you'll work on that. And then in the CD, I would try to feel more one beat per bar so that we get the bigger gestures. They're these gorgeous phrases and they, they got to me a little bit caught, a little bit stuck and a little bit slow. And I'd love for them to have this big orchestral sweep. You know, I think that's what it means there. Okay, um, let's see. There was anything else? Oh, there was a tiny thing, but it's an important thing. And that is, um, you do the octaves, the low octaves, and so on. And then there's a fermata over the double bar line. And I really miss that. I think you need to take time for that. Because, you know, that's a really climactic sort of exciting moment. Blah, 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 blah. And then you need to make us wonder what's coming next. You know, that should be a real, it should be a surprise what happens next. Uh, so take the time to really create that sense of, of drama. You know? And let's see. I love the sound that you got at the Ampocede, the very last one, you know, when everything's going crazy. That kind of thing. So I thought yeah. that was really very nice. I thought I love the sound. I thought it was very orchestral and very rich. Um, I thought in the very last measure, when you do that, I think that you could be a little faster there. It felt very much like one note at a time. And certainly we have to practice it that way at first because it's hard, you know, and you want to make sure you hit that last note. Um, but it needs to feel like a gesture. You know, it's like all the ballet dancers just sort of fall on the floor all at once. And it, so it needs to have that sense of gesture. And if it goes too slow and is too noty, it, it loses that sense of direction. You know? So if you could just try for that, then it'll be a really exciting ending. And you just have to trust that you're going to find that note. You just watch it, but you look for the note before you start that gesture and you just go for it and people will be wowed <laughs> because it's a really exciting finish. Great job, Thank you. really very really nice. It was great to hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, and then I think we have Aurora next. Is that true? Hi, Aurora, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you for your performance, for sending in your videos. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you did the Debussy Arabesque, which I love, such a beautiful piece, and Tchaikovsky's July, which was really a nice nice contrast to the Debussy. 
So I, overall, I thought you captured the mood of the arabesque really very nicely, which is a, a fun thing uh, to play. Um, I just have a couple comments um, in the, oh yes, uh, let me see if I can find, where's my score? Oh, it was right in my hand. I put it down. Um, in the triplets in the beginning. If you could try to find more of a fluid way of playing some of those, I think a more fluid touch, I think that would be really nice, particularly in um, that, that kind of gesture. It sounds a little too loady to me right now. Which is important when we're first getting like the twos against threes. It's really important to make sure everything is just so. But I think you can just let go now and feel much more of that sense of gesture, even in the beginning. It's not about just the you note. Know, no, you've got those melody notes, and then everything else is just like water. So just allow it to flow a little bit more. Okay, and then in measures 13 to 16, that stringendo, getting faster. If you could make that a little more gradual, it felt like we came on really quick with that. And then we, we stopped getting quicker. We just kind of like reached a new tempo and we stayed there. And then we slowed down, I thought maybe a little too early. If you actually start the stringendo a little slower and then just gradually get it faster and wait to do the retardando until it's marked, which is just the last two beats of that, of that section, I think it'll be really effective. So that would be one thing to think about. And then the other thing is in measure 59, where is 59? Oh yes, uh, middle section. Take more time with these tenuto notes. They're each marked with tenuto, and that's just like WC telling us, just hold on to these notes, just enjoy them a little bit more. I think that's that's uh, important for that. Now, in the Tchaikovsky, I thought you did a good job. There's one thing about it, though, that I thought that there were too many big beats in each measure. You know, uh, I think it's, let, let me just see if I can pull up the score. I don't think I have it handy. I thought I did. Uh, but it, there were just too many big beats in the measure. I think it's in 4-4. Four, four, uh, and it felt like we had like one, two, three, four sometimes, instead of more like one, two, three, four. So try to find a little bit more of like a sense of flow, a, a sense of lightness in, in how the piece moves. I think that would be really effective. Um, and then we're going to be able to hear where the high points are in the phrases. It's been a little hard to hear sometimes when I first heard you, first heard the video. It's a little hard to know. So where's the goal point in these phrases? Because it was just a little bit too, um, too strong on every beat. So think about that. I did love how cleanly and crisply you played the 16th notes, the 16th note passages. I thought those were great. Those really worked well. So it's just a couple of things to think about. Very nice work. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. Take care. And I think next we have Winnie. Is Winnie here? Is Winnie in here? Winnie. Winnie Wong? Uh, yeah, I, I not see, not, not see she, she in here, so we can next. Oh, okay. Mm. okay, so if she comes back, we will... Uh, yeah, I will. Her, but we'll go. We'll go on then to Yinming Huang. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Good. Thanks for joining us and for for being patient. Um, you did a great job. I was really glad to hear you did the Bartok Bagatelle and the Rachmaninoff Etude. I thought those were two very nice pieces. I thought your Bartok Bagatelle was very nicely done. You know, you handled the shaping of the phrases very well, and you did a really, you had a really nice sense of rubato in the piece, which I think is really important. You did that very well. So I just had a couple of little comments. Um, every time that you have a retardando or a molto retardando, 
I think you could exaggerate them more. I think it would be really nice if we could hear them uh, slowing down even more because you're already slowing down some when you do the rubato naturally. And I think that if you were to slow down even more, it would be really effective, really very nice. So consider that. There were some retardantes that went by and I thought, oh, I didn't really hear much there. I didn't really hear much change. Um, also, anytime that you have a quieter dynamic, make sure to exaggerate that as well. There were some quieter moments that I felt like we sort of, we, we missed the opportunities that were there to, to have a change. In general, um, I felt that if you had had more dynamic variety in the quiet, particularly in the quieter passages, that the, that the uh, performance would have been better still because you had so many good things going on, but it was, uh, I just felt like the dynamics were kind of like here and I would love for them to have also gone down there because then that makes the, the louds that you do that much more exciting because you know, there's so much more uh, contrast, you know. So that's just a couple comments about that. In the Rachmaninoff etude, I thought you were very sensitively, uh, you played it very sensitively. I thought that was really nice. Um, I just want, there was one thought that I had about that. And let's see if I can find that quickly. It's a really beautiful etude. I always enjoy hearing that. So I'm glad you're working on it. I don't know if I'll find it quickly. Um, it's in Opus 33, is it? Well, let me show, uh, tell you what I had, what, what I was thinking of. And that is that um, I think things would have been even more effective if the accompanimental 16th notes in the left hand were gentler and a little less noty, which was, you know, something that I've commented on to other people as well. This song oh, here, I finally found it. <laughs> if you could make that almost feel oh, a little bit more like it's Debussy, I think it would be really effective here. I think that would be really nice because you had such a wonderful way with the melody, you know, it was very clean and distinct and, but, to me, the, the left hand felt a little too much like the right hand. A little too much like that, I'm exaggerating. But if that could be more of a wash of sound. Then the right hand can be very much floating above that, you know? So I would try to make that difference in the way you approach the accompaniment and the melody. I think that would be really nice and clear here and it, it'll be great for us as we listen. I did think that you brought the left-hand melody out really nicely. When you were in the veloce section, the faster section, I thought that was really clear and very nice. Um, again here, just like in the bar talk, try for much quieter quiets, quieter dynamics. You have some pianissimos, like when you, on the last page, when you come back to tempo one, that's not pianissimo at first, and then, you, then it changes. But if you could find quieter moments like that and others, I think it'd be really nice. And then also in the last two lines or so, you've got uh, yum, brum, 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 and it keeps growing. And it's got, you've got the Sacella Rondo, which I thought you overall handled really nicely. But then right before that last low G, before the scale, you've kind of pulled back on the last couple of notes. And I can imagine why it gets really hard because you have six quick notes in the left hand and three quick notes in the right hand. But if you can instead just propel yourself into that last low octave there, it'll be really exciting. So try to resist the temptation to make it easier on yourself and to pull back and instead just go for it. And I think it will, it, it'll really be very exciting for us as listeners for you to just, you know, sort of slam into that. It's not a very musical idea or term, but if you can really just launch into that final low octave, it's gonna propel you up too, I think, because you're gonna have so much energy going into that. It's gonna be so easy to, to do that scale up the piano after it. Great, I thought that was very nice. Otherwise, uh, everything I thought was, was just beautiful. Okay, congratulations. Yeah, take care. Okay, and then Kevin, I think, is next. Do we have Kevin? Hello. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good. 
Good. So you're very talented. It was so nice to hear you play. I heard the French suite, uh, a couple of movements, the Mozart Rondo. It was really very nice. Very uh, good attention to detail in your playing, which I thought was, it's not always easy, um, but I thought you really pulled that off very nicely and bringing out what we needed to bring out, really paying attention to the dynamics, to the articulations. You made everything so crystal clear. And I thought that was really wonderful, particularly for this repertoire that you're playing. It's so important. In the French suite, I love the articulation, love the dynamics. Um, in the pickup to measure 15, let's see, I don't know if I have, do I have my French suite score here? Yes. Okay, in, this is for the Allemande. Um, in the pickup to measure 15, yes, your left hand comes in and it was nice and strong when you came in. I thought that was really, really effective. Then, then uh, at the end of that measure, you come in on a C sharp. I wondered right there if you might consider coming in a little less on that C sharp, just to create a little bit of a difference between the two phrases. You've done it once really strong, then change it up the second time, just a little bit more. So uh, other, you know, it's just a small thing. Um, then uh, that was it for the Allemand because it was really so nicely done. Very, very, very nice playing, very nice Bach playing. And then the Gigue, let's see. Oh, just a general comment for the Gigue. And I've been mentioning it to other people too. Um, the, everything was very much in place. It was, it was really terrific. I just wanted to hear a tiny bit more freedom, a tiny bit more, joy in the playing. I mean, the cheek is so much fun, you know? It, it is a joyous movement. And I think it's so easy to get stuck in, oh, this is hard, you know, or I'm trying to get everything just right, like my teacher told me and like I've been practicing. And then we get kind of in a box. And I think if we can just kind of push away the walls of the box, then suddenly the music comes to life and it's really nice. So it was already very lively and nice, but I think you could have gone just a little bit further. So just give yourself permission to have fun. You know, with it. And I think it'll be great. Okay. And then in the Mozart Rondo, I love the playing. It was very sensitively done. I thought the balance between the hands was good. It's not easy in this piece, but it's very important because sometimes you have theme in the left hand and sometimes in the right. Um, I thought your phrasing was great. Uh, every once in a while, and this is very hard in this piece to do correctly, the 16th note, dotted eighth note rhythm, the bam, ba -dum, ba -dum, that rhythm didn't quite come, it wasn't quite clear. Sometimes it sounded like you started the 16th note, that bottom, sounded like you started it before the beat rather than on the beat. Uh, I think you'd have passages like, and it, sometimes it sounded, I don't know, let's see if I can do it. Like, it. like they just got a little bit off from one another, left hand and right hand. Make sure that we really hear it very clearly. You might even think of giving a shadow of an accent to the 16th note so that we can just hear what's happening. I think that that might be nice. Might be effective there. And I think that was it. I think I, I, you did so many nice things. It was great. So it's just some, some tiny little thoughts to think of. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care. And next we have Hardy. Hardy Shu. Hi, Hardy. Uh, hi. How are you? Uh, I'm good. How about you? I'm doing well, thanks. So I enjoyed hearing your WC. You did the WC arabesque and then the first two movements of the Beethoven first sonata. That was great. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah, so uh, I thought you did a good job with your performance. And I, so just a couple of things. Um, uh, WC first, let me get my score out. In fact, some of the comments that I made before, I may be making again, uh, I'm not sure. Let's see, measure five. Oh yes, I remember what I wanted to tell you. In measure five, you've got some, a, a retard on down. And it happens again later in the piece when the same music comes back. Um, and there, there's a retard on the right there. And I felt like you went maybe just a little too far on the retard on 
which is something that I rarely say, as most people don't go far enough. But if you could just think of that retardando as just a gentle stretching before we go back into that, to the next section. Mm -hmm. I think it would be nice, nice to, to do. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah, so just, it's not, it's not a really dramatic return. No, it's more of a subtle one. Uh, and then if you could make the next couple measures, that falling idea, that more gestural, a little bit more gestural, more like a waterfall. It just was a little too much note to note to note. Okay, that'll really mm -hmm. help, I think, there. Um, and then in measure 37 to 38. Oh yes, right here at the end of the first section. I'd love for you to just linger a little bit more. Just hold that moment before you go into the next. Don't, don't rush through that too much. Just enjoy that a little bit more. Okay. The same thing. Um, and then of course we have the retardando at 37. 16, what did I write? Oh, no, that's uh, something else. Oh, oh, and at the very end of the piece also, just linger. Don't be in a rush to end the piece. I felt like it was a very metronomic, very correct, but it lost some of the magic and the, the imagination of the piece. So just enjoy having a little bit of time. Just, uh, you know, it, 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 be a little bit more imaginative with how you use your time there and how you create the mood. For everyone okay. uh, playing the arabesque, we had a couple of people, um, and probably everybody else too, it'd be interesting for you to listen to Debussy play it. There's a recording on YouTube. If you put in Debussy playing Debussy's arabesque, you'll find it. And it's really beautiful. It's very different than we play it now. And I'm not suggesting that you listen to it so that you copy it because there are things that he does that I think maybe uh, maybe there are other ways of doing it, but I just, it's an interesting thing to be able to hear the composer play this piece. He also has a recording of Claire de Lune, that very famous piece where he's playing it as well. Might be fun for everyone to listen to. Anyway, oh, there was another general comment, which I um, wanted to make sure everyone's aware of. When you're playing from memory, as you were, um, put the music rack down. Try putting the music rack down on the piano because you'll be able to, first of all, you don't need it because you're playing from memory and you will be able to hear more of what you're doing. You'll be able to hear more of the details of the sound. Some of that gets trapped by the music rack and just gets sort of sent back out to the, to the rest of the room and you don't get to hear it. So just put the music rack down. It's a simple thing and you'll get to, it, it, you'll be surprised at how much of a difference the sound of a sound there is. Then in the Beethoven, let me find the Beethoven score. I've got lots of scores floating around here for all these different pieces. Okay, in the F minor. Let's see, what did I write here? 47 to 48. Oh yes, uh, right at the end of the exposition. That's definitely a place for pedal uh, to connect this and that. Just make sure to bind those chords together. Uh, mm -hmm. In 68 to 81, this is a really important passage here for balance of the hands. The right hand is doing stuff like that, but it's the left hand that's important. So make sure that we can really hear the left hand more than the right. I would really think about the right hand, maybe feeling like it's pianissimo and the left hand much louder. So that it's going to be a really starkly different uh, dynamic from the, between the left hand and right hand. They're going to be very different. Right? But that's so important so that we can hear what's really going on. Mm -hmm. um, there are going to be a couple of other little details in the, in the sheet that you'll get from the competition. Um, the ending of this movement to me seemed a little bit abrupt. And I know you've got these staccato chords that Beethoven's given you. But I wonder if you might think about those last couple chords, maybe finding a staccato that's not as short, but that maybe sounds a little more final. 
just hold on to those notes just a hair longer. I think it'll make a big difference in making the piece feel like it actually came to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And in, in movement two, I thought your ornaments were very crisp and clear. That's really hard to do. And you, you made them look like they were just the simplest thing in the world. <laughs> which was Thank nice. you. Uh, your fingers are very quick, which is, which is a great thing. Um, in this movement, they'll always make sure that you're really going for lyricism. We need for those fingers actually to slow down, to go into the keys slowly. <laughs> the effect is one of real tunefulness. And then, you know, it's great to have all those ornaments so so in your fingers, that, that's what most people struggle with. But if you could focus more on the lyricism, then we'll really have something really special. That's great. And then also on the two note slurs, like in measure 18, where is that? Oh yes. Try to um, phrase off so that the second note of the two note slur, in this case, the C sharp, Try to make that quieter so that there's a nice diminuendo. Anytime that kind of thing happens, and it happens a number of times in the piece, try to make sure that that happens. And then mm -hmm. the pianissimo sections, if you can get quieter, I know I'm saying that to pretty much everybody, but if you can get a little quieter, that'll be really terrific. So that we have those really, those really special moments of uh, something different than what we've had elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Great. Very nice. All right. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Take care. Okay. And who's next? Is it Chia Liang? I don't know if I said that name correctly. I yes. Jie Yang. Jie Yang in Jie here. Jie mm, Liang. Yeah. Mm. Hi, Jie. Are you there? I see he in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jie Liang. Oh, okay, great. Should I, should I start? I see he. Okay. I just want to make sure he didn't like step away for a minute. Okay. Yeah, he in here, but... <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Maybe he's away. Maybe okay. he's away. You think if okay. he stepped away, we can come back to him? Maybe I don't want to... Okay, okay. Oh, are you there? Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Great. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like talking and then no one was there. Because uh, yeah. you never, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I, I thought you did such a great job with your uh, Rachmaninoff, your WC, and your Stravinsky. What a great uh, collection of pieces, for one thing. And I really liked how you did very impressive playing, um, very powerful. Um, uh, interpretations and you have a real command of these pieces and you played with such intensity. It was really great. So I, I enjoyed all three pieces. Um, in the It was interesting too, in the Rachmaninoff, uh, the etude, which I loved, it's a, it's a great etude. So I was glad that you played it. Um, the main thing that I felt like that I, that I was missing, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record because I've been saying this to most people, and that's a, um, a really very dynamic level in this piece. I felt like there were a lot of loud moments as there should be, you know, it's a really intense piece, but there are some quieter moments. And I felt like in general, if I had to just listen and say, and, and just kind of uh, make a general statement, I would have said that in the Rachmaninoff that the dynamic didn't really get much below a mezzo forte. Well, maybe some of it has to do with the recordings and, you know, we're not hearing things the way things are sometimes because of the recording technology or doing things on Zoom and all that. But um, I just felt like if we could have found a, a really, truly quiet dynamic, we would have had a different kind of intensity, you know, because there's, there's obviously there, there are moments of huge, big intensity and, and we love those and we, you know, we, we can't wait for those in this movement. But or in this piece, but if I look through the score, I mean, just on the first page, I see a couple of pianos and only one forte. And then on the second page, I see some really big moments, but I also see a diminuendo to piano and then another piano and then another piano. That's just on the second page. So there are actually more piano markings than there are really loud markings. 
So it takes a lot of control and it's not easy to get those quieter moments to really come through and to be consistent. But I think you can, I, I know you can do it. And I think it'll really bring the piece to a new level. And because what you're already able to do is just, you know, terrific, you know, it's what most, a lot of people can't do. But uh, if you could really find a way to bring the dynamic down to a, to a whisper, a really uh, wonderfully um, projected whisper, then I think in, in those moments and find some different colors, I think we'll really have something very special there. Cause it's a, it, you're already, you've got all the, the sort of the nuts and bolts, they're already there, you know? It's just now refining that dynamic. Now you have all that in spades in the WC in the Pagodas. I thought you played with wonderful dynamic variety um, it, it was subtle, it was nicely colored. So it's really just actually bringing a few sprinklings of that into the Rachmaninoff, you know? You sometimes wouldn't think that you would need one and the other, but you actually do. You need some of that subtlety that you had in the, in the Debussy, in the Rachmaninoff. Now, I, I mentioned in the lecture, uh, sometimes Debussy gives you like a whole note or a long note. Make sure that your pedal also uh, allows those whole notes to sound because sometimes they got cut off early. And that was a, uh, a chance that, you know, Debussy's saying, I want you to have resonance here, and we just cut it off. So make sure we keep that resonance going and try for a real true pianissimo in the final um, uh, premiere tempo, the final um, return to a tempo. That's gonna be really special there. You got down to like piano, but if you could get a pianissimo, boy, that would be really amazing. That would be really special. And the Stravinsky was really, really very impressive. Very exciting, very passionate. Uh, you had such command of, of the notes and you created some really powerful moments. Um, I like that you found some quieter moments in the Poco Meno Mosso section. I thought that really worked well. So that was really good. Um, in general though, if you can also, again, try to find not only differences in dynamics so in the other spots and the and, and the rest of the piece but also because it's not just about dynamics but it's about color changes i really felt like we could have had a few if we had a few more color changes in, in uh, different timbres that that would be really nice so it's like you know you some painters have about you know four or five colors that they work with and then other people work with a dozen and I'd love for you to have, you know, a dozen colors at your disposal in this piece, rather than the five or six that you're already using well. Just try to broaden a little bit more. And it's gonna, gonna bring out some new aspects of the piece. Yeah. So it's, it was great. Do you play the whole Firebird Suite? Um, well, I played a piano arrangement. Yeah. Yeah, but but I mean, have you have you done the whole you've done the whole thing? I know you just played one movement for for the video. Um, I played the whole thing. Oh, good, good. I'm glad because it's a it's a great uh, great piece, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So terrific job! Congratulations! I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So take care. Bye. Bye. All right. And next, I think we have Yu Chen. Yu Chen Fu. Hello. Hi, Yu Chen. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good. Good. So you're very talented, you Chen. It was great to hear you play. I really enjoyed it. Um, so just a couple comments. Um, we're going back to the Bach, the C sharp major, which a number of other people have played, which is great. Um, I love your energy that you had in the prelude. I love the tempo. I thought it was great. I thought that was really nice. Um, I think I mentioned this to someone else too. I think it, uh, I wanted to mention to you as well. Um, to try to find moments to, to change the dynamic a little bit and come back a little bit. Um, there's this one moment where you, um, in measure 63, that's definitely a moment I think where you can come back to a piano and then you can grow and grow and grow. You did it a little, but I think you can go further. I think you can do much more. So that'll be really exciting. And the fugue, a very quick tempo you've played with, um, but you made it work which was really something that was nice. Uh, so in general, I'd be interested to hear a bit more rise and fall of the phrasing. It yeah. sounded a bit like the phrase was a bit, you know, it was very crisp and nice, but a little bit like this. And I love bum, ba, da, 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 dum, bum, ba, da, da, dum, bum, 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 a little bit more of like a, a an arc to that phrase, you know? Yeah. Um, and then 
Also in measures 35 to 37. I'm sorry. Oh yes, you have a sequence. Let's see. To me, that's another place where you could vary the dynamics. Maybe you could have like a terrace up or down, but I would experiment and try some different things there because I think that could be really nice. Yeah. Then we also had the pathetique, third movement, third movement this time. That was good. Again, crisp articulation, really like that. It was very exciting. Um, that was all very good. And, um, and going back sort of to what I was talking about in the lecture, be careful not to hold left hand notes for longer than one beat when when it's marked. Like in bar seven, uh, no, bar 19, where was that? Oh, yes. It's very common for me to hear the pedal all the way through or the, just the left hand held all the way through that bar, but it's just really for a quarter note that you're supposed to hold that left hand. So, which really gives the attention all of a sudden to that left, to that right hand melody. It really mm -hmm. makes us listen to it in a different way. So there are a number of places in the piece, that's just one, uh, where you've got to really be careful of the length of the left hand notes. So just be careful about that. Maybe go through and circle the rests. Yeah. Okay, and then, Measure 51. Oh, yes. You've just come off of this. Crescendo. Really come back to piano here. It'll be really exciting. We're, we're not expecting that. We're expecting the forte to continue. But mm -hmm. Beethoven always does that. He, he starts a crescendo, and then instead of making that crescendo finish in forte, he does the exact opposite and finishes in piano. And then if we're not careful, it'll just, we lose a lot of the effect that he, I think he's trying to go for. So really challenge yourself to get quiet there. That'll be exciting. Then when you get to measure 29, uh, 79 rather. You change the dynamic there very nicely. If you could also change the mood. I think we'd also be really, we'd be doing really well because it finishes really big right before that. And then try to be more lyrical, more smooth. So it's music that's been like this, suddenly going the opposite direction. Just try for that kind of feeling. I think it'll be really exciting. Good. Um, let's see. Oh yes, in the very last chord, and there are a couple of other comments that they'll send you in the email. Um, but in the last chord, yeah, da, 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 you know, the, the, you've got the scale. I'd hold on to that last chord a little longer. It felt really abrupt. So really hold on to it. For a full quarter, and, and then that'll really help the piece to feel like it. Yeah. Great, Eugen. Good Thanks. job. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. You too. Bye. Okay, bye. And then do we have a listen? Hi, Alisa, you here? She's I'm not, not sure. Yeah, Alisa. Alisa, 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 if you're here, speak up. <laughs> I think I think he she know in here. Not yeah, here. I'm not yeah. sure. I didn't, yeah. I didn't see her yeah. name. So then yeah. we just have one more, right? We have okay. Dawa. Yeah. Hi, Dawa. Hi, nice you? to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for waiting around. You've been very patient. I appreciate it very much. So I liked your repertoire, uh, the Piazzolla and the Beethoven. Those were really nice contrasts, you know, and you know, it was great. So uh, the Piazzolla was new for me. I hadn't heard that before. So that was really fun to hear. You played it well and you had a lot of um, the passion, you know, that we that that piece needs that uh, it's really great. So I like that a lot. I just had a couple of comments about the Piazzolla. For, to think about. Um, first of all, I wanted to hear, and I keep saying this to everybody, but I think it's really important. I wanted to hear a little more dynamic variety. Um, most of it seemed to be like from mezzo forte on up. And I would love to find some quieter moments and particularly with the left hand. To me, the left hand felt, I know it probably has some accents marked and things like that, but it felt like it was fairly heavy. and 
because of that, it was a little hard sometimes to hear the right hand as much as I wanted to be able to hear the right hand. So I think that if you could make the left hand just a little bit less, I think the balance will improve a lot. The other thing is that I was wondering if it would be possible to try just a slightly faster tempo. I know that's dangerous to say because then that changes like things, you know, things feel differently, but you might try experimenting with it. Uh, it doesn't have to go a lot faster, but even just like one click on the metronome faster might help things to flow just a little bit more. It is a dance after all. And I, so I just want it to feel like it's moving forward, like if there's a forward motion, physical motion to it. And I think that'll be really nice. Now in the Beethoven, um, oh yes, in the Beethoven, I've got my score here. If, if you could be careful to make those chords in the left hand a lot quieter. You know, we've got this melody in the right hand. But if the left hand comes in too loud, it kind of takes over as being most important. So um, be really quiet with that because it is marked piano after all. All those chords need to be very light, just very, very gentle. So be careful about those. And in general, whatever hand has the accompaniment, in that case, it was the left hand, but later, uh, a couple pages in, in measure 68, uh, then it's the right hand that has it. It's the right hand's doing this. And the left hand has the melody. And there, make sure that that right hand accompaniment stays with you in the background. We're not used to that. Usually the right hand is the melody hand. And so we're used to bringing it out more. There, you're going to want to swap that completely on its head, turn it on its head so that we can really hear that left hand melody. That'll be really exciting. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. At the end. I think you turned these quarter notes into half notes. So that the, the, the piece slowed down right there. Make sure to keep the tempo going. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It really actually goes quite fast there at the end. So it takes a lot of practice to get those chords comfortably in your system. That would be, that'll be good. Okay. okay. Um, as I said also to Hardy, when you're performing from memory, just lower that music rack on the piano. It'll help you to hear better. And we just had some memory slips in the in the piece, you know, um, in the Beethoven. So when you're practicing and those happen, I would say stop and try to figure out, well, where exactly did they happen? You know, find out where in the measure it was. And then what was it that caused it? Was it particularly one hand or the other? Was it that one hand didn't come in in the right place or forgot? Or is it that there was a maybe something in the rhythm that was... That, that, that was hard to remember? Or was it that you that we played like the wrong harmony? There's so many different things that it can be. But if you can really zero in on what that is, I think it, that makes it automatically easier to remember it the next time around, because you've got like a mental flag saying, I've got to remember that that left hand comes in on a C, not an A, or that it comes in on beat two, not on beat three. And that just makes it easier to remember the next time around. Anyway, good playing. It was nice to hear you. It was nice to hear everybody. So thank you all for you. being part of the competition, for sending your videos, and for allowing me to hear you and to share my thoughts. Uh, thank you for your patience. I know it's been a long meeting. And for some of you, it's at the end of the day. And for some of you, it's smack dab at the beginning of the day. So thank you all. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Odell, thank you so much for your lecture and comments. And thank you everyone for your time today. We are going to send the results of the preliminary round, which includes the contestants mark and today's comments through email a week later. And for those who are the winners of the first prize and second prize, you are qualified for the final competition. And the deadline for registering the finals will be July the 1st. And if you are interested in participating in the finals, you will need to send your biography in English, a photo of yourself, and original videos to our email, gocamusic at gmail.com. 
And we have put everyone's videos on the, our website at gocamusic.com. And everyone is welcome to go to our website and take a look. And finally, thank you again, Dr. Odell and everyone for your time to participate today. And good luck to all the contestants for your results. Yeah, good luck, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Matthew. Wow, you're good talking. Yeah, I think help help my uh, 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 contestant um, a lot. Thank you, thank you, Matthew. And uh, let my me <laughs> let me uh, speak a little bit Chinese. Okay. Mm. 呃，感谢感谢各位选手在嗯，就是嗯，坚持这么长的时间在这里学习。然后呢，我们的比赛，我我希望把学习放在第一位，让你们感受到在这个比赛里面学到很多的音乐方面的知识。那我们每个星期都会有安排这个这个大师的这个点评，欢迎你们就是继续去去聆听。然后在这个最后的时间，我希望就是大家可以打开你的呃 camera， 然后跟跟那个嗯我们的评委一起 take a picture。呃、uh, ，we take a picture together, open all camera。嗯，好，你们可以 ，Melody， you can talking， yeah。好， yeah, 大家可以 ，yeah。Um, so we would like to take a photos um, yeah. with, with Dr. Odell and together. So please turn on your camera. Yeah, turn on your camera, and we we can talk. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Professor. <laughs> okay, now I take picture. One, two, three, smile. <laughs> okay, again. One, two, three, smile. Okay, and. Uh, you can open a uh, mute and say thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Okay. Bye. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah! Very good job. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I spent your um uh, three hours. <laughs> I know, I can't believe it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, very good talking. Yeah, thank you, thank you, and um and uh, see you, see you, see you next time. <laughs> Sounds um, good. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I will send email to you. Okay, terrific. Well, have a good rest of the weekend, and thanks for thank asking you. me to do it. Thank it. you. Thank you. We see you your final final completion. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.